Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting here Tuesday, January 16, 2018. <clears throat> I want to apologize to everybody. I, I've got a laryngitis, so I'm going to be a man of few words, and it's hopefully I make it through. Sorry. So, okay, I've got uh, Brendan next to me, so he'll, he'll be sure to chime in. We actually opened earlier an executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining updates by the town manager relative to police and fire. Uh, the uh, petition of Eversource zoning and zoning exemptions the D with the DPU because an open meeting may have had detrimental effects on the litigating positions of the board. Considering the purchase sale and lease of real property in relation to the uh, uh, trails in the city of the center trail because an open meeting may have had detrimental effects in the negotiating position of the town. We had allowed Norman Kamal and Lane Lazarus to participate in the executive session. So, uh, I'd like to start with the um, Pledge of Allegiance. Would you, uh, yes, Mr. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> so, uh, public forum. The residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions re re regarding town government. Is there anybody who would like to come up and uh, beautiful, <laughs> Mr. Moderator? Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I have uh, two items for the board's consideration this evening. <clears throat> Earlier in the day, I had sent notes uh, both to. Uh, uh, Mr. Kamalo and to and to the chair uh, on these issues. The first issue is related to my uh, responsibilities as town moderator, and specifically, I, I uh, in anticipation of your budgeting for fiscal year 19, <clears throat> uh, want you to consider introducing electronic voting to town meeting. It's something which is being done in a in a number of communities within eastern Massachusetts, uh, probably western Mass as well. Uh, there, there are several vendors whom I've contacted and, and to whom I've been directed by other members of the Mass Moderators Association um, who are providing these kinds of services uh, across the Commonwealth. I've done some very, very preliminary research with uh, several of the vendors. Uh, they have all sorts of different services from rental to purchase to um, uh, self-service to uh, support that they provide on-site if, if needed. Um, I, as a straw man, I asked them to provide some background on cost uh, for a two-night town meeting, anticipating 250 voters on each evening. And um, again, depending upon whether you go with a self-service approach for rental or something where they provide uh, a lot of personnel support. The cost can range uh, for the, for the two-evening town meeting anywhere from $5,000 to $15,000. So I, I throw that out as something in your, in your uh, budget deliberations for consideration. I think other communities have found that uh, the use of electronic voting can uh, greatly improve the efficiency of town meeting, i.e., uh, you know, work through the various votes that we have in, in much more rapid fashion than the current approach that's, that's, uh, that Hopkinton is using. Uh, that's uh, one further comment as well. If, if you uh, do uh, decide to include some budget for this uh, for next fiscal year, I would uh, also request that a committee be established to include me, the town clerk, clearly someone from uh, the town's IT department and maybe a member too from the public to evaluate how electronic voting you know, might be used and to solicit proposals on behalf of the town for a uh, you know, formal presentation. I've heard that they, excuse me, they do work very well in some communities. However, does that pull out the, um, the ability of everybody in the town to see how everybody else in the town <laughs> is voting. You don't get to know that, how um, <laughs> I don't, because <clears throat> isn't that been part of the 
Part of the fun. It, <laughs> part of the pro to that <clears throat> is that um, it's encouragement for people to vote, you know, without fear of any reprisals being directed to them or, you know, without criticism from their neighbors. So on, on the one hand, you know, you could view that as a positive. On the other hand, you could view it as a negative. Clearly, the communities that have adopted this feel that it's more of a positive than, you know, than, than a negative because uh, it enables people to vote their conscience without any fear that uh, uh, they might, uh, there might be reprisals or you know, criticism from their neighbors. I think, um, first of all, uh, Tom, I want to thank you for kind of starting to think of ways that we can modify our town meeting and, and bring it to the next level. Um, I think going on and on and on without, without any discussion of change can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you go on without change, but you're at least looking at different ideas, you know, that, that's great, right? You know, at least you're looking <coughs> at the options. Um, yeah, I think I, uh, I, I share both of your opinions in terms of uh, you know, worrying that, well, not worrying, but thinking, okay, town meeting is one of those times where you stand up for your vote, but on the other hand, you know, maybe the vote will be a little bit more accurate uh, if, if you don't have to fear retribution or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, reprisal or anything like that. I think it would be great for us to um, uh, have another, have a meeting where we do discuss different options for modifying town meeting, understanding that much of it is the prerogative of the moderator, uh, you know, whether it be allowing electronic voting or possibly, uh, you know, changing up the order of the warrant <coughs> articles and how they're taken, whether it's, uh, you know, starting from the back forward or going random or something like that, uh, so that we can say, hey, you know, if you're going to be here, be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't just come for one article. <clears throat> um, but I think that kind of throwing around different ideas is great. I think that, um, you know, something like this, uh, certainly it, it, it probably warrants a little bit more discussion, but for such a, for such a small amount set aside in the budget, uh, I wouldn't want to hold things back um, and you know, un until we have those discussions necessarily, so. Uh, no, I didn't know that we covered <coughs> Well, no, normally we don't, but just the, when the Tom Waterwater comes, it's, it's, it's a special day. It is a special day. No, it, but really, no, because, you, know, you know, this is, it's, it's, a, it's important. It gets, it's a, it is a town meeting, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, all the work that, that all, we all do during the year all culminates at that, on those, one, two, three, four nights. <laughs> <laughs> One, two <laughs> nights. <laughs> just, just a question, uh, Tom, what is the medium for actually doing this? Is it a handheld device that people, how, how do people actually do it? They are, time? they are handheld devices. Uh -huh, and so if effectively, I mean, one of the vendors refers to them as a clicker, but uh, essentially you get to, to click yes or no the, the results are taught uh, automatically and instantaneously uh, tabulated and you get uh, in, an immediate indication after the voting is closed. Mm -hmm. you know, typically it's a 30 second, 40, 45 second type of uh, opportunity to, to, uh, to make your vote. Um, and then, you know, on the screen or somewhere, you see an, an immediate and exact tabulation. And obviously, you know, as you as you get into this, um, you know, first year, you've got to prove to the uh, collective town meeting that you're getting accurate tabulations. And so, I'm sure there'd be some some um, break in period of of doing the the sort of standing vote that we do uh, in comparison to an electronic vote and demonstrating for the benefit of the town meeting participants that you do have the same you have the same result. Only it happens much more quickly. Sure. So the one thing that I've had, I guess I take issue with, um, is I know that we are a form of open government. It annoys me that we get sometimes 100 people to decide a $62 million budget. I don't know if, you know, I know a lot of people I know say, 
Well, I don't really care one way or the other on a few of these articles, so I just watch it at home on the television. Yeah. I'd love to see it have a one-day <coughs> delay from HCAM, so yeah. they can't see it live, and if they want to make a difference, they could come up, and uh, I'd love to find out, find ways to, to get some more people involved. You know, like when we're at the middle school auditorium, and mm -hmm. we're standing for a quorum to get 100, 100 people or so, uh, with a $16,000, I mean, 16,000 person town, uh, where we're, we're spending money <coughs> haphazardly, I would love to see a way for us, you, anybody in town to come up with a way to get some more people. I don't care mm -hmm. if we have to cater it. Uh, <laughs> just get some more people there to, to make some decisions because it's, it's, uh, it's sad that you know, I saw the South Bro Town meeting, and it was standing room only, and thousands of people. And here we are. I think probably the best town going around. And we're, you know, if there's not a school issue on the on the ballot, we're screaming at 100 people. We'll see if Start Line Brewing can help us get more people there. There you go. It's a Hopkins and based company. <laughs> That's right. Well, we, uh, a, a informal group of people, uh, including Connor and, and myself and some EHOP uh, people have met and have been talking about uh, the possibility of, of having some food available prior to town meeting, whether that's a, a food truck or something that's outside of uh, the meeting hall for half an hour before and maybe half an hour right at the outset of town meeting as a way of um, enabling people to get to town meeting without feeling that they have to go home first and have a meal and strolling late. Uh, so, so there are some things that are under consideration, and I think anything that, that we can do in advance through efforts of, of Hop News, through efforts of uh, uh, sort of pre-warning the community what, what is going to be considered at town meeting, what the issues are explained in plain English you know, well in advance of town meeting, can help. In addition, everything that we can do to make the meeting itself more efficient. This is one tool. I, you know, we'll be exploring yeah. other tools as well, so that the pace of the meeting can be quickened a little bit. Uh, still important to discuss the issues, but the the more people can be aware of the issues in advance of town meeting, you know, through these kinds of sessions on HCAM, through EHOP News, and so on, uh, the greater likelihood that we'll have an informed electorate uh, and, and who will come out to town meeting yeah. and. You know, devote an appropriate amount of time, but don't feel that they have to devote 10 or 12 hours right. to the items that are under consideration. And I know, like, I don't know if we've ever looked into, like, a town-sponsored uh, babysitting program that, that would allow some of these parents that are, you know, can't come up because they have kids to, <coughs> to, but whatever. That's something we're getting out of the road. four quarters right now, but. Well, but that's but also yeah, something, something under consideration. We should, we should yeah. continue. To discuss and again, this. the. <clears throat> the, the point of uh, being here tonight is anticipating that we need budget we need budget if we're going to proceed but just because you establish a budget in the end if it, it if it's determined um, through study over the course of the next six to 12 months that uh, you want to defer it and you know it can be deferred as well but I thought the first step was to <clears throat> Make the request for for some uh, budget opportunity, and and then go on to more formal consideration of the process. So, Mr. Carlo, can we uh, look into that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In your uh, second point. Second item. Uh, <clears throat> I have the uh, distinction, however dubious, of being the chairman elect of the Davenport Village Condo Association, and uh, in conjunction with Davenport Village and several other uh, condo associations, all that happen to be served by one particular uh, management company, uh, the associations including the Preserve Indian Brook and Stagecoach. Um, we want to make a request, again in, in the budget season, that the town consider providing trash and recycling services to the condos within the community. Um, we represent within these four developments some 214 households. Um, you know the taxes that are paid by the condos. Uh, from from my perspective, don't aren't really differentiated from the taxes that a single 
home taxpayer uh, is paying the town of Hopkinton, and yet we're not getting the same level of services, in particular with trash and recycling. Um, we, uh, obviously, we have trash collection. We pay for it directly to Harvey. We chose not to do recycling because the cost was disproportionate relative to the cost associated with the trash pickup, uh, which leads to, I'm sure, a level of uh, compliance with the recycling guidelines and, and objectives, which is much lower than it would otherwise be. So both from the standpoint of improving the level of recycling that's done, cutting down on the number of trips that, uh, that we end up making to the recycling center, and then simply as a matter of fairness and equity, we'd ask that the town consider extending the, the current trash and recycling services to all of the condominiums within the town. We can uh, we can definitely discuss it. <clears throat> so I don't it. know if it's a slam dunk because you know we run into this stuff <clears throat> with plowing. If the town doesn't ex has an accepted roads and mm -hmm. and that, <clears throat> but um, I'm going to still try and be a man of few words right now. <laughs> well, I, I also want to be clear that we're Mr. Chair, we're we're not asking for town plowing at this point. We appreciate having. Um, at this stage, we appreciate having private services in that regard because they do, not only do they do the street, but they do the, the driveways, they do the sidewalks and so on. So it's, it's a different, le different level of service in that regard, but we view trash and recycling as somewhat different in that regard. Mr. Kamau, is there any um, precedent for this? Uh, I think the the board and, and staff need time to review the request and okay. we can comment later. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to come up? Okay. Move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the Board of Selectmen consider approving the 12 5 17, the 12 uh, 19 17 Board of Selectmen minutes. Gifts, the Board of Select will consider accepting the following gifts. Unrestricted gift to the library account from the Appleby Foundation from an anonymous resident, the amount of $5,000. A resignation, the Board of Select will consider accepting the resignation of Jessica King. Um, from the <laughs> Capital Improvement Committee. Does anybody want to break out any of the consent agenda items? Break out the third one. Resignation? Sure. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to break out the second one. So I guess we're breaking out them all. Yeah. Okay. Out the first one. Okay. So the uh, chair uh, <coughs> seeking a motion to uh, accept the uh, uh, minutes from 12 5 and 12 19. So moved. All those. Okay. Yeah, second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. <clears throat> okay, the second one, the gifts. I just wanted to break this one out because um, when an anonymous resident uh, donates something that large, $5,000 to the uh, to the library, it's a, a great thing. And um, I see we have a library director. Would you like to come up and use that while you're here? Good evening. I'm here well, mostly in case you had any questions, but um, yes, this was an astoundingly generous gift from a resident. Um, it's about 1% of our annual allocation from the town, so it's it's a big deal for us, um, and we're planning to use it for um, materials and also some programming. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I request a motion to accept the donation to the library gift account from the Appleby Foundation. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? And motion passes. <coughs> Resignation. Yeah, I'd just like to, to um, I don't think I know Jessica King, and I don't know how long she's been on the Capital Improvement Committee, but I would certainly like to say thank you. Uh, anybody, no matter if they give a large amount of time and, and experience to the town or a small amount, uh, I don't like to see it go unnoticed. So 
Uh, I would like to make sure that we get a letter out to Jessica King, thanking her for the time that she put on the Capital Improvement Committee and, and thank her for her service. Great, thank you very much. So, Chair, I will rise requesting a motion to uh, accept the resignation of Jessica King. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. <clears throat> Okay, the 2018 seasonal estimate population. Pursuant to uh, Mass General Laws Chapter 13817, the board make an estimate of temporary increased resident population in Hopkinton as of July 10th, 2018, to be submitted to the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission for seasonal licenses, which the board may issue. Said temporary license may be effective from April 1st to November 30th or from April 1st to the following January 15th at the discretion of the local licensing authority. In accordance with the statutory required method of calculation, the estimated seasonal population in 2018 is 15,048. So with that, um, is there any, any discussion on that? None here. Okay. Uh, then Chair requests a motion to approve the seasonal population estimate of 15,048 for the purposes of the ABCC form. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Oh, it's out. Uh, thank you. Uh, the chest. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You're killing me with your vote, so <laughs> I'm uh, making an executive decision. I'm going to start <laughs> taking over. <laughs> All right, parade permits. The Board of Selectmen will considering, uh, consider approving the following parade permits. From Stephanie Whalen on behalf of the 15th Annual Sharon Timlin Memorial 5K Road Race to Carry LS. The event will be held on June 16, 2018, rain or shine, beginning at 8.30. Starting point is Hopkins School Road. Ending point is Loop Road by Lot H. Stephanie Whalen will be responsible for control of litter and event day management. Applicant request closure of Hayden Row between Grove and Chestnut uh, for approximately 30 minutes. Expected number of participants is no more than 1,800. Applicant is in process of securing certificate of liability for the 2018 event. Okay. Um, any, oh, oh, do we have anybody here from the, um, no. All right, Glad. so um, do you have any? Well, actually, I, I did have a couple questions, and, and I know <clears throat> our, our two chiefs are here, and I know this is an annual event, and they it's for a great cause, and, and they run it <coughs> every year. Um, I just, in re reading of the application, that's why I wish they were here, um, there is a road closure of the whole Hayden Road stretch there, for about 30 minutes, and um, I wanted to recommend that in advance of that race, they put some small signage at the end of each of those Charles View roads so that people that live in that area are aware that even though it's only 30 minutes, the road is gonna be closed on that day because if you live in that neighborhood and you're trying to pick somebody up at the airport or whatever, and all of a sudden you find for half an hour you can't get out um, you know, that's a problem. Um, and I know we do this all the time, but um, I, I would like to ask them to put some signage <coughs> notifying the residents in advance that those roads are going to be shut for those hours. And can we pass that along to them or? Mr. Kamala, can uh, we put um, post facto conditions in? Yes, the board can include that as a okay. condition. Uh, I I yeah, I, I think that's a fair thing. And yeah. and my my other question, and, and maybe yeah. our, our first responders here can answer this, because they are, I noticed it said in the application um, the fire department would provide two persons. Um, it's usually an EMT and a paramedic on site plus an ambulance. So I'm wondering, um, are those needs filled out of our regular staffing, or do they hire a private ambulance, and do they pay overtime? Um, or, because my understanding is some of our resources are already pretty stretched. Um. Yes, basically uh, I work with the police and we do an assessment of 
the number of people they think will participate in the event, and we try to do an impact. That's one of the larger events. So they, um, in agreement and working through the assessment with them, um, they choose the option of adding an additional uh, staffed ambulance. It's theirs that we parked um, strategically for that event. And then um, for that event, it happens to be near the fire station, but I kind of plan that day that that's the response zone and we're kind of have that situational awareness. So that's for each event that you re we review for you that there's some type of preparedness plan. Um, I also attend with the uh, deputy and we, we just kind of coordinate the race area. We have a communication center for this okay. event that we uh, monitor police, fire. Um, they have a, their own first responder group that they brought in through the American Red Cross. And so that's all part of this event. Um, each event, I kind of look at the size, the race, rate, the race route, how we can access it and, and do this analysis. So both the ambulance and the personnel that are on duty in that time are not taking away from our own resources that might be needed within the town. Right, the personnel that are on duty, this is just an, an additional thing that they watch. Okay. The event itself, this one raises to the level where we add an ambulance at their expense. At their expense. And, yep. and is the personnel at their expense as well? Yes. It is, okay, yep. thank and, you. And if I'm not mistaken, they saved a life last year. Um, you know, that was one of the stories <clears throat> I reported to you, you know, it was a really neat outcome and preparedness mm -hmm. because they did some work on their own where they got the American Red Cross to bring in some volunteers that travel route areas where it may be more difficult for us to watch access. So between those personnel, the police officers that are around the roost rate, where, race route, I'll get that one right, <laughs> where we stage you know, our command posts and vehicles we watch it all. The communications for that event went through, and I thought the outcome, that's why I reported that one to you. I, I, you can't ask for a better outcome for preparedness. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I have no, no questions. Yes. No questions. Oh, yes, come on. I, Claire, I can ask, actually answer your questions. Um, yeah, just so everybody else can hear you. Um, just because I run the Timlin Knock every year. A resident of Charles View, so we all get a robocall. You do, everybody, okay. and then there is a sign. One of the electronic signs is right there on Teresa Road on the right. Okay. Oh, great. Thank so you. As long as so they're notified, it would stink Excellent. to get caught. And you, for half Thank an you. hour, you can't get out. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Uh, right. So, um, so we'll s separate the two of them out. So, um, uh, chairs, looking for a motion to. Um, I'd like to, I'll move to approve the uh, <laughs> Sharon Timlin Memorial 5K 2018 parade permit as written. Okay. I'll, I'll second, but I'd like to make a friendly amendment. Uh, that being uh, pending the successful securing of the certificate of liability for the 2018 event. Sounds great. I accept that friendly amendment. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <clears throat> From Pam Shelley on behalf of Faith Community Church of <coughs> Hopkinton for a road race slash walk for providing clean water to children and families in poverty areas on Saturday, May 5, 2018 from 9 to 11 a.m. Starting and ending point will be Faith Community Church. Estimated number of participants is 500 to 1,000. Josh Morrison will be the on-site event day and litter control manager. Oh, great. Thanks for coming. No problem. I have a couple things for you guys as well. Here. That's my personal information on there. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. You're welcome. Boys. <laughs> Nobody's in good shape well. today. You're the Thanks, only one who's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't doesn't start. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to hear this request. Um, this is our second annual race with this. It was an incredible success last year. We had 650 people come out and raise almost $60,000. Um, all of the proceeds from the ra race registrations go towards clean water projects in areas that need it around the world. Um, world we partner with an organization called World Vision, and their model is every $50 is a child that gets clean water to last their lifetime. And that looks like, it, 
looks very different in different areas, but it's hygiene, it's um, actually access to water, it's a ton of different opportunities um, to make an impact. So we're excited to partner with you guys and with the town of Hopkinton and the communities around us to be able to um, play a part around the world. Thanks. Any um, well, Josh, welcome, and uh, sounds like a great event, and uh, we're, we're you know happy to have you. And uh, I'm, the fact that there aren't road closures, it makes it a lot less uh, yeah. less complicated. Um, just one little comment, because I'm the one that made the issues about litter control in the past, mm -hmm. uh, and I did see your plan, um, which it may be an oversight. It just mentioned litter control at the where the personnel would be at the individual. Um, mile markers and at the water stations, but I would recommend that you also make sure you have someone drive the course after the race is over to check yes. the entire course. Yes, definitely. Mr. Starr. And um, I'm assuming you guys are getting a certificate of liability as well. I actually have that with me today, yeah, okay. so we're good to go. Great. Yeah. And last year's event went smoothly, no issues with uh, public safety. Are Correct. Content? Yeah. Good. They're both not in agreement. Excellent. Good. Motion to approve. Second. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> actually, uh, yes. <laughs> approve parade permit for um, Brace Walker, May 5th, 2018. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> could you uh, grab the next one? I could grab them all. Uh, Woodville Historic District Commission appointment. Board of Selectmen will consider appointing one of the two Nominees submitted by the Greater Boston Real Estate Board to the Woodville Historic <laughs> District Commission to a term expiring 6-30-2020. The two nominees are residents Kathy Dragon and Alan Connell, or Connell. Are either here? Both are here. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Alan's just sitting right there. Come on up. Yes, thanks for having me. <clears throat> You're um, welcome. Yes. Thank you for coming. I, I have, I, I'm just going to beat him up if I start talking. <laughs> You're going to beat him up? My voice is just great. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you have any, any questions. Um, I mean, <clears throat> so often we struggle to get people for these boards, and now we have two great qualified people, <laughs> so it's like a feast or famine here. Um, you know, I, I really... I'm grateful that you've stepped up. I see you said you've, uh, I read that you've marketed a couple of historic homes in Hopkinton. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in, you know, what your thoughts are on, on the importance of a district and, uh, um, you know, maybe how you've approached marketing those historic homes. So I, I haven't marketed any homes in Hopkington uh, specifically. But other historic. Yeah, we've sold homes you know, outside of Hopkington. Uh -huh. So I'm, uh, yeah, I work with a, a team of six other agents. Uh, we <coughs> list and help buyers purchase uh, historical homes, mm -hmm. you know, throughout Massachusetts. I'm licensed in Rhode, Rhode Island as well. Um, you know, preservation, uh, preserving historical, you know, homes and uh, natural I live on a lake here in town, and I'm part of the LMP, LMPA. Yes, yeah. uh, so, you know, preservation, I'm part of that community. Uh, it's, it's something that I have passion for. Uh, uh, like I'm in, in and out of many homes throughout the year, uh, and a lot of those are antique historical homes. Uh, and it's just uh, it's, it's something that I, uh, I enjoy doing. I, I, we, like I said, we, we, mar we market them differently they're all unique every every home's a little differently but a little different obviously because they're they're older homes usually mm -hmm. but um, overall I, I I just want to give back to the community get more involved in, t in town here uh, I'm, I'm fairly new to town I'm here I've been here for four years I live on Downey Street in Hopkinton uh, but I just want to you know have an opportunity to give back in in another way mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm giving back to my community in and around the lake area but I want to you know expand that a little bit so that's why I'm here. And, and, and so your company in, in marketing the homes has specifically focused on the, on the unique qualities of a historic home and, and um, tried to find buyers that appreciate Yeah, so it's definitely, that. they definitely uh, cater a specific buyer, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, in, in 
historical homes, you know, they, they usually need a lot of work, but obviously uh, that, that's why the district and the commission you know, came together to preserve you know, that history, uh, exterior and interior. So I Thank you. respect that. <coughs> Mr. Ted Stone. Uh, no, the only question, I just want to make sure that you lived in town, which you do, and um, you answered my question why you wanted to serve on this. So I don't have anything. Mr. Um, my question is actually for Mr. Kamalo. Is there, is there more than one board or committee in town that has a seat designated um, to be someone from the real estate community? Seems to recall there was another one that we always have a difficult time. Santa School filming. needed one, and we didn't have one. No, I mean a more permanent. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> it's both districts. Uh, we we have two historic district commissions in town, so both okay. districts do require. Um, and is one the of other seat filled? Do we know? Mike Allen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, I don't have any further questions. I, you know, I appreciate you coming out. Um, you know, it's great to it's great to see that people are engaged in the community and want to give back. Um, and uh, you know, the tough part is when we have more than one and have to make a decision. <laughs> but uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kath. But uh, if, if I may, um, don't we have associate positions on, on both those boards? Remember, we ran into this the last time. That was on the historic commission. The historic commission. When this is what the historic district. District. Oh, this is historic district. Oh, this is the. It was the historical commission. <clears throat> okay. Kathy. Kathy, come on up. So I've actually never been in front of any of you before. So. Excellent. So well, you ask me questions, or how do we do this? <laughs> Why don't we start out? Why don't you uh, just introduce yourself to everybody? And um, Kathy uh, Dragon. I've lived here since 1986. Um, most of that time in Charles View, we just downsized to the middle of town, and um, I've been a realtor for over 25 years. And um, I think I might make this easy on you um, because I think it's so great to see somebody up and coming wanting to do this and. I've been volunteering for 32 years, so <laughs> I just, I'm just, I just think it's great that he wants to do this. So I would be more than glad to step aside and let him do that. If you find something else you want me to want to do, that's fine. But I, I'm thrilled to see somebody that's excited about it, and he seems to know historic homes, which I think that's, that's really important. Um, I mean, we always use a different home inspector for historic homes because you find something out very interesting. You just can't have your run-of-the-mill home inspector. You have to have someone who appreciates it, who understands, you know, there was a plague of hickory trees back, you know, at the turn of the century, and that's why, you know, they're really, it's a really great piece that the house is built on. So you need people with that kind of information. So, but it seems like he's very well-versed, and that's important, and as a resident of the town, I think he'd be great. That's wonderful. That's yeah, that's wonderful. So. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's really much appreciated. Thank you. You know, I was going to say after four years <clears> on the uh, downtown corridor project, you might want a break anyway. <laughs> yeah, it would have been nice if people listened to us, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, it, that's a whole other, you know, <laughs> ball game, so. We understand that. Okay. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yep. Okay. Thanks for everything you've done so far. Yes. For your, really? for your first 32 years. Yeah. Four years. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I would right. make a Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Thanks, Thanks, Chairman. I move to appoint Mr. Alan Connell to the Woodville Historic District Commission for a term to expire June 30th, 2020. A second. Let's vote quick before he leaves. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? <laughs> You're in. You're in. Don't let him get away. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Alan. for coming. Thanks for stepping up. Yeah. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> so the next is uh, Sodexo Food Services for Dell 176 South Street. Uh, it's the
the common Victrawler 2018 license renewal. Uh, Board of Selectmen will consider renewing the common Victrawler license for Sedex Odell at 176 South Street. Hopkins staff recommends. No, how come we didn't do this one a couple weeks ago? They must not have got it in, in yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. Through the chair, this was listed in the annual license renewals. Unfortunately, at that point, uh, we did not have a complete application. Now okay. we do. It's been reviewed by all town departments, and staff is recommending approval. Do you have any questions, Mr. Camaro? So I, I move to uh, read this. <coughs> Request a motion to renew the common Victrola license for Sodexo Food Services, Dell at 176 South Street. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. <coughs> Friends of Hopkinton, 2018 Family Day. Board of receive an update from the Friends of Hopkinton for the 2018 Family Day plans and preparations. Oh, we're early. No, no we're Ms. not early. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, um, we were all really looking forward okay. to discussing and talking party. Uh, and unfortunately, our friends are not able to join us tonight. They will join the board at a future date. Okay. Yes. No, I was looking forward to that. Everybody loves a family day. Yes. Excellent. Okay, um, so none of these are uh, time constraint. Okay, conservation restrict in South Mill Street. Oh, no, you, jeez. The Board of Selectmen will consider signing a conservation restriction which grants the restriction from equestrian building com company to the Hopkinton Conservation Commission on 2.4 acres at 11 South Mill Street. The re restriction is required pursuant to an order of condition issued by the Conservation Commission and has been signed by the owner and the Conservation Commission. The restriction area includes vernal pool habitat. Excellent. Okay. On that? Um, Mr. Kamala, is there any, um, anything unusual about this? Uh, it seems straightforward in the, um, in the packet. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, let me provide some background. However, I think overall, uh, the request has been reviewed by the Conservation Commission, Town Council. They have all approved the restriction as presented tonight. Well, both, both entities are in agreement. There's not much to talk about, is there? Or is there? Any questions, Mr. Sestari? No questions. That's right. Oh, it's over here. There you go. One second. Oh, went away. It was there and now it's gone. I don't know. There you go. Oh, thank you, John. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, there you go. <coughs> um, I, I just have a question. Are those are those house lots that have a restriction, restricted land on it, or is it all open space? I couldn't quite tell from the plan. So this particular property is a house lot that has a restriction on the rear portion. So it's one house lot. Yes. It's a, that great big piece of land is one house lot. Yes. Okay. Wow. All right. That's nice. So it's 2.4 <coughs> acres of restricted. Okay. Yeah, I got it right here. Thank you. It's part of the original brain farm. Right. Okay. So with that. The uh, request a motion to sign the conservation restriction for the property at 11 South Mill Street. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes. <clears throat> the Board of Selectmen will receive an update from the town manager on proposed FY 2019 operating and capital budget requests. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I believe that we're supposed to be joined by Mr. Herr at some point, correct? Uh, in about an hour. I would suggest we try to hold off on this uh, until Mr. Herr gets here. For okay. Both? Just to start, is that for the draft budget capital plan and the budget capital hearings discussion? Well, I think that we need to um, uh, prioritize and go through 
the lower priority items mm -hmm. first and just, you know, <coughs> see if he gets here for the, for the final discussions. So you want to jump to, like, board liaison reports? That would be my suggestion. But I'm good with that suggestion. Remember. Okay. All right, board liaison reports. Uh, I was part of the, we've had a, a, a meeting of the elementary school building committee. Uh, everything there is going very, very well, I would say. Um, we are, I think they said, what did they say, like 100 days ahead of schedule, and that is calendar days, not, uh, not uh, business days. Uh, and they're under budget, and everybody's doing just a lot of due diligence and working their, their hands to the bone trying to cut costs and, and uh, give a quality product. So everything is going very well there. Put my stamp of approval on that. Excellent. So far. Ms. Wright. Um, center School Reuse Advisory Team. Uh, there is an electronic and a paper survey <coughs> that will be coming out momentarily, I think. I think it's going to be in the independent. It's going to be on the town website. Um, there are going to be a number of different ways that citizens can participate, either electronically or by paper copy. Uh, in advance of there will be the first public forum on the on Saturday morning, February 3rd, at the senior center. I'm thinking it's I'm thinking it's 10 o'clock. Can't remember. It's not nine. It's 10, I guess. So that's going to be just a very open kind of a brainstorming session for people. We'll first do a uh, an overview of the project, or well, not the project, but. Um, the, the procedures that we're going through, first steps being first public input, uh, there will be sort of a video tour <coughs> of, the, um, of the school itself <coughs> and then turning it out to the people that are there to just come up with ideas. Um, it should last about an hour and a half. So not pending there's no you know, snowstorm, um, hope everybody at home puts that on their calendar for the morning of February 3rd to come out and um, let us hear your thoughts about uh, reuse ideas uh, for center school and, and your priorities in particular. Um, the only other thing is this morning um, the SWAP division of MAPC, I think that's Southwest Advisory Planning Council, I never can remember what the acronym is, uh, which, which is a subset of uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. They held a, um, a regional meeting right here at our library. Um, Elaine was there, I was there, uh, Jen Burke, um, talking about a variety of planning issues in the, in the surrounding communities and um, also discussing the governor's um, new legislation to uh, assist communities with housing development, um, also some initiatives on changing the process for zoning changes, initiatives that would reduce the two-thirds vote required for communities to change their zoning to a simple majority. Um, I know I responded in an email on that and uh, at that moment, I did this morning also share my concerns that um, much of these initiatives seem to be focused on increasing housing production without much attention to the long-term effects that the housing increases present to communities long-term expenses of, of roads, of schools, of first responders. Um, I, I, I would like to see the state um, give a little more consideration to the impact that, uh, you know, increased housing does, does, <coughs> does create for a community. But anyway, that we were glad to host that this morning. And um, so that's my MFPC update. Can't think of anything else right now. I just have a quick question about the uh, center school. <clears throat> Is anybody bringing up any costs at all involved with, with uh, the reuse, that, you know, because of, of the, some of the major changes that would have to be done yeah, to that building yeah. to make it usable? 
Well, some, some things like hazardous materials, there are other pieces of information that we already have in some way from some of the other studies that were done, both when the library mm -hmm. looked at it for use and when the school looked at it for reuse. Um, and they will be having to do some studies on, you know, the whole variety of rehab, of, you know, because it's a historic district, I mean, there's nothing to say that the entire interior couldn't be torn down and, and new construction be put. Um, considering maybe using a portion of the building, keeping the, certainly keeping the gym, Parks and Rec is very interested in keeping the gym going. Um, I mean, they, they will be looking at costs, but we'll also have to be costing out what the various options are. Um, I don't think right now there's, I mean, everybody recognizes that what's there now has some serious, serious problems for use today um, between um, hazardous materials, between things that don't need coat, between you know just the size of the restrooms you were talking about. So I think anything you do, you'd have to decide what the town needs first and then decide how can this be best be fit into this building. We're not necessarily thinking we're going to use that building as is. So there will be cost estimates, but, but not yet. This is sorry. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, the Youth Commission uh, had a series of events and celebrations for Martin Luther King Day and uh, celebrating his legacy. Um, I haven't gotten any report on uh, how things went. Well, maybe you can no, I was there. give a little bit more detail then. I was at, out of town. <clears throat> yeah, that was a, it was a lot of fun. There was a, a great storyteller that, that came in uh, that Tamoria brought in and um, really made history fun. We had um, <clears throat> telling a story about the Mombet from um, uh, near um, at, it, 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 Ashley Falls. Was it? And um, how how Massachusetts was such a f front runner in the in the uh, abolition of slavery, and and she just made history fun for the kids. And it's something that I know all the kids will remember because it was a, it was just a great the story well told. And then the rest of the events where the kids uh, all all got together to to make a variety of things from hats to scarves to to cards and 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 uh, all kinds of other. Uh, um, crafts to uh, to give to uh, people in need. So that was it was a, a lot of fun yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, I, I just no, great. Didn't. Nope, that's all. That's all from my groups. Um, uh, let's see what I have. I have a, a a draft letter I can show show the rest of the board that I wrote up um, for a meeting uh, last month, expressing the uh, our. Um, uh, desire to have the sculpture of uh, Bobby Gibb here in town, the uh, first uh, woman runner of the uh, Boston Marathon. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I, I wrote up a draft of that and so we talked about it. And then the uh, DOT meeting last week, uh, I'd like to actually hand that over to uh, Mr. Kamalo if you don't mind because I'm running out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just give us an update, you can give people an update on, on, on how you feel that, that went. Yeah, through the chair. Um, at least from my perspective, I believe the meeting went very well. Uh, the objective of the meeting was for Mass DOT to hear directly from the community uh, on the various perspectives, opinions, and suggestions regarding the Main State Corridor project. Meeting was well attended. Um, we had a diverse representation from town committees, town departments, business community. Uh, and I think um, the response from the community was strong in, in, in many respects, including one, uh, affirming the components of the project that the town uh, has almost unanimous support on, as well as identifying aspects of the project that would require uh, a continuing conversation amongst town boards, town staff, uh, and most likely would be refined going forward. Specifically, uh, the meeting did confirm that the project is still uh, up for consideration under the TIP program scheduled for construction in FY19, uh, that the 25% design 
uh, will be adjusted to accommodate the resolution that was reached between the uh, town staff and the Historic District Commission subject to approval by the selectmen on the configuration of Marathon Way. Specifically, uh, based on the conversations with the Historic District Commission, Marathon Way would be a one-way street um, going towards Ash Street, will retain its parking composition, uh, and there will be a slight uh, reconfiguration of the island. Um, I think overall, again, great meeting, well attended, good solid comments from the community, and that was the intent of, of holding the public hearing here in town. I concur. <clears throat> the only other one I have update on is the school committee. Um, last Thursday, they um, uh, approved their budget um, just to meet the deadline of, that we that we proposed. Uh, that's in the, um, uh, I think we, I believe we have it in the charter also. <clears throat> but they understand that we have to work together to um, um, get it down as close as, as close to the bone as we can. <clears throat> but we're going to work collaboratively, collaboratively to uh, make that happen. Good. Okay. I have um, <clears throat> one thing that I would like to bring up. I don't know. I'm not a, a liaison, but with the <coughs> recent weather that we've had, the sub-zero temperatures and the water mains that are breaking, and, <coughs> and um, you know that that big blizzard that we had. I'd like to take a minute because I feel very confident where I've worked with the fire department, I've worked with the highway department, and I've spent a good portion of my adult life not working with the police department. Um, I would like to, um, as a selectman, say what a wonderful job uh, the police chief, the fire chief, the DPW, all its employees have done. Uh, I know that we had two water main breaks when it was sub-zero weather. Uh, one, I believe, was on East Main Street. One was on Thayer Heights. Um, these guys are out there with their, you know, getting soaked, working in sub-zero sub temperatures while we're sitting home throwing wood in our wood stove and watching you guys on TV. And, um, you know, the fire department for responding during that, the police department for being out all the time. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed for me as a taxpayer, as a citizen, and as a selectman. So. Thank you very much for the work that you guys do. When we have uh, adverse weather, crazy things that happen, that seems to be, um, you know, you guys rise to the occasion and do a great job. So I'd like to thank you uh, as a selectman and as a townsperson for the, for the hard work and the great job that you guys are all doing, all three departments. And, I, and I'd also like to thank the DPW. I, I love going from <clears throat> Milford into Hopkinton, from Ashland into Hopkinton, South Broadway into Hopkinton, and you can see a line. You can, <laughs> it, you, and we, our, our roads do look better. <clears throat> I came in from Upton uh, during the last storm, and I immediately, um, uh, when I when I reached the uh, coffee shop, sent a sent a note out to uh, uh, John Westerling, um, noting that uh, our roads look the best. And, 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 and also thank you to the, uh, to the chiefs because, um, you know, the, the police chief has his guys on the road all the time. And then the uh, fire department that has to go out no matter what the weather conditions are. So thanks also. And then because we are so ahead of schedule and I'm stalling to try to wait for Mr. Hur to get here, um, <coughs> I noticed um, that the Parks and Rec has gotten the outdoor uh, speeding ring yes. Yes. up and running at uh, behind the old high school <laughs> Carrigan Park, however, however people know it as. Um, and I saw the lights on there last night. I saw people out there using it. I didn't get out there and use it yet. Uh, I have to check to make sure all the insurance waivers are all set for the townspeople because I'm not known to be the nicest person when I put skates on. So, um, <laughs> no but fighting. it is a wonderful sized rink. Uh, it accommodates all levels of of uh, ability, my my kids are going to be out there. I'm going to be out there. My wife, uh, and it's just it's a great way to bring the town together, and uh, it, it's nice to see it out there working. So kudos to all people involved: the water department, the fire department, Parks and Rec, um, the townspeople for for helping uh, getting it going and, and for using it. So uh, it's a great it's a great um, 
item that we have out there and I think everyone should try to get out there and, and, uh, and get out on skates and try it out and enjoy it. So thank you to all. Clear. Um, well, two things, but echoing what uh, Brendan just said about the rink, skating is such a wonderful activity. And I know the year they had two years ago, which unfortunately was the horrible snow year, but when we had it up at the high school, those kids were out there in the coldest weather, 10 o'clock at night. That means they weren't at home, on the computers, playing the games. They were out in the fresh air. I've seen them down at the Ice House Pond with shovels, trying to shovel the snow. One day down at Ice House Pond, I saw a kid with a leaf blower trying to... That's how much kids really want to skate. And it's just such a wonderful, wholesome outdoor activity to get kids outside at a time of year that often you're not. So um, I'm, I'm just delighted. Um, I just wanted to mention, because we do have a couple more minutes, um, for people who are watching at home who have been in town for a number of years and would remember, um, for 16 years we had a very fine superintendent of schools, Mr. William Hosmer, who just passed on recently. Um, and uh, I know I went down to the calling hours and spoke to the family and spoke to them about how much Hopkinton valued his service and they were very very grateful to be told that and so um, uh, our both our board of selectmen and the school committee did send a note to the family um, recognizing his service but for those who are newer to town um, during that 16 year period starting in 1980 and through 1986 Hopkinton went through some rough times with our schools and uh, Newer residents may have been attracted to this town now because of the good schools, but it was not always the case. And um, there was one point when we had voted in to have school choice where students could vote to go to could opt to go to some of the neighboring communities instead of Hopkinton. Um, one year, I think it was close to half our senior class, senior class went to Holliston schools. When you leave in your senior year, that really says something about what's going on in your school system. It was a huge wake-up call for this town. And Mr. Hosmer um, took us through a really critical period. And as we know today, our schools are something that we take pride in. Um, and you know where we are as a town um, in many different areas is a direct result of our level of professionalism and um, <coughs> talented people um, that, ha that have gotten us there. So I just personally want to take this opportunity to pay our respects and thank Mr. Hosmer um, for the 16 years that he was our superintendent. Very good. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Camalo, how about the uh, town manager's report? Yes. Um, Do you think we should jump to that one? Do you want to go to future board agenda items? In in fact, what I wanted to do on the town manager's report is to uh, update the board on the town meeting articles, and that ties in with item number 12. Okay. Okay. So, you want to do future board, future board agenda items? Sure. Okay. This is story. Um, nothing. This isn't going to buy you much time because <laughs> I don't have anything either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Josh. Actually, you know what? You know, I'd like. To, maybe we can. Uh, and this is just way outside the box. Um, I would like for the town to have maybe a competition in our schools for either a theme or a design for all the little banners that we have going through town uh, on the various utility poles. Uh, it's great to celebrate the library's opening, but it's open now. Uh, you know, maybe we have something that's more year-round that we can always put up between events, something celebrating our veterans, you know, celebrating something else. Uh, but maybe we can have some type of a competition in the schools to <coughs> let the kids help decide. Just a suggestion. Would that be on um, all polls or um, just, the the, just the single polls? <laughs> 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 okay. 
single poles that aren't in the middle of the roadway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one thing I have is, um, I know that I touched on it last time. I don't know if there's anything that we can do officially, but try to find out um, with like Legacy and the Muse to make sure that we are populated appropriately, that we can monitor or find a way that we can monitor um, the, you know, if we have a two bedroom house that there are the appropriate amount of people living in that. And I only follow up on this because someone had watched this meeting uh, the last time who was an architect and said there are parameters of how many people can live per square foot. So if we have uh, a three bedroom condo, apartment, whatever, whether it legacy farms, whether it anywhere, and there's 11 kids going to school using that address, um, it's not appropriate and we need to make sure that uh, that we're falling under the the um, the, the uh, proper safety. safety. I don't even know how to how to word it, but real estate you can't. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if if we have legacy farms and we have a, a three bedroom apartment and there's eight families living in that, I think we need to to be able to monitor that and and accurately reflect that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to do talk about that stuff offline right now because um, <clears throat> there are uh, privacy concerns and there are also re there's real estate law concerns involved in that stuff. <clears throat> so that's why I wanted to make it a future board agenda item. Well, we can do it in executive session or whatever. Well, we'll but it's to talk about it yeah, with some, yeah, we'll put that one offline. Okay. <clears throat> um, and, and I don't have any because I can put on anything. Um, all right, what else we got? Capital hearings, Mr. Kamala, would, uh, um, you know, other than adjourning, um, <laughs> we're, in, we're, we're, we're at the budget. Yeah, perhaps <clears throat> if it's okay for the board, I can jump on to the, um, the piece regarding town meeting articles. Yeah, that's okay. what I was going to suggest. Okay. Um, upon further review, <clears throat> our staff has identified the following articles that may be included in the annual town meeting warrant. Financial articles. Uh, it has recently come to our attention that whereas the town has set up an OPEP transfer account. Uh, new regulations require the town to actually establish a trust. Uh, DOR has determined that anything less than a trust is open to the town going back to that account and repurposing through an appropriation process, a town meeting, the OPEP funds for other uses. And thus, they now expressly require the town <coughs> to form a trust for the other post-employment benefits. And then secondly, as you may recall, uh, there was a discussion between the finance director and CPC uh, regarding an overpayment that was made in one of the CPC grants. Uh, we are still talking to CPC as well as our auditors <coughs> to see how that issue can be addressed. Could you give us some more detail on that? I'm not sure I heard the comment. Yes, um, this was in regard to, it was in relation to multiple grants that were issued by CPC approved a town meeting for the reconstruction of the HCA building. <coughs> uh, and through a combination of factors, 
and that grant is an overpayment. And we're now looking into how that issue could be addressed. So how we can recoup those funds? That's part of the conversation. Okay, um, and then on the general bylaws, uh, there have been several issues that have been raised regarding. Can I, I'm sorry, can okay. we go back for a second? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of what questions I can and can't ask right now. Yes. But what's our process? What's our process for distributing those funds? Is there a request that comes from, you know, whatever group is getting the money? and then we disperse the funds, or do we just go and cut a check? What's the process there? The process is after town meeting approval, CPC identifies either a project manager or a group of project managers to oversee a project. And all the funding requests come flow through the project manager and receive final approval for disbursements through CPC. Is that project that manager somebody who's on CPC? In some cases, yes, it's somebody who is on CPC. In some cases, I think, I don't recall if we've used town staff. Um, so sometimes it's a volunteer, sometimes yeah. it's a paid employee. Is that a contractor? I'm trying to remember if we've used <coughs> town staff uh, are here in Hopkinton. I, I, I'm not so sure. But usually there's a volunteer who's identified as a project manager. What uh, what amount of money are we looking at here? I don't remember the specific amount. Um, I seem to recall. I, I can the pull up. I recall that the original the original grant was supposed to be for fifty five thousand, and I believe they spent almost double that. I recall they spent about a hundred. Yeah. Um, let me look at my emails. I'll come back to that. If, if I may just interject, I mean, uh, the CPC projects that I've been involved with, which were on a smaller scale, still the same number of digits, but not as quite as many, um, the individual committee or board that's, that, uh, that made that application directs the project. Yeah, yeah, and when they have a bill, that committee has to sign off on the bill first. <coughs> And then it goes to CPC for approval, and then it goes for payment. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe this will cause a, a re-examination of the tracking or accounting procedures uh, uh, that each, I would think each grant or each committee is responsible for keeping track of their own funds. I mean, the ones that I've managed, I knew exactly how much money we had and knew how much the grant was and knew how much we were spending. So I, you know, uh, whether maybe we should be asking those boards to be submitting reports on the individual <coughs> expenditures, I, I don't know. Perhaps at this point, let's pause the meeting until we have a quorum. <laughs> oh, this is true. <laughs> Now we have a quorum and we can continue. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah. My voice was getting really bad. I, be I believe the overpayment was fifty-five thousand. So, so what are the, what are the, and I'm and I'm not trying to look in any particular direction, but what are the overall legal ramifications of something like this, where uh, these expenditures were made? Uh, without town meeting approval, essentially, I know it was in error, uh, but what are what are the possible ramifica yeah, ramifications here? Yeah, that's why we've asked DOR, the Department of Revenue Services, to to guide the town, okay, as well as our town auditors. And are we working with uh, the the benefactors of those additional funds? 
and trying to work on it from that end as well. Yes, um, Chris did work extensively with Kelly Grill on the issue, just to make sure that we were looking at the same pieces of information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, do we need a motion? Uh, no, we don't. We don't need a motion at this point. I'm going. I'm going to go back to the list of articles. With your permission, Mr. Chair, in one second. Song. Almost. We could <laughs> do the Pledge there. of Allegiance again. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> general bylaws, um, th there have been a, 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 a list of issues that have been raised regarding noise, uh, and I think it, it may be helpful for the town to take a look one more time at the noise bylaw. Um, related to that, we have also received <coughs> complaints regarding uh, uh, animal noises. Um, and we're thinking that perhaps as part of discussing the nuisance by law, we may also look at the nuisance animal noises. Uh, the fire chief has asked us to look at the concept of a crowd manager. Um, we have also received input regarding tobacco position for individuals age 21 that we may, with the, with the development of uh, e-cigarettes, that it may be helpful for us to take a look at that by law. Um, and then, when we, when the town considered the, the revolving accounts new regulation, uh, which was put forth under the modernization by law, uh, we understood clearly that the state and DOR were still working out the kinks in terms of how to implement the, the new revolving fund uh, by law. And when we submitted the, the town meeting actions from 2017, uh, the Attorney General's office had specific comments uh, for us going forward. And we're hoping that uh, this time around, with the guidance from DOR, we can further refine the implementation of the new revolving fund bylaw. We have also received indications uh, from our cable council that the town may need to establish a new revolving fund for income that we receive through our, our cable licensing process. Uh, this is an issue where DOR has issued conflicting guidance. Uh, we're working with town council to see how at least we can go through that mist and at least have some clarity uh, as to whether the town is required to establish a revolving fund for those funds. And then, there are several land acquisitions that have been discussed uh, over the past months. There is the 130 Summer Avenue Historic Preservation Restriction, the Leonard Street Drainage Easement. This is an issue that has come to us through uh, DPW. And there has been some conversation regarding Verizon utility easements in town. Uh, and then finally, um, there may be property acquisitions that the board has discussed in executive session. Administratively, we have received uh, conversations and discussion points regarding early voting and how towns can implement early voting. Um, we have also had discussions with Ashland and Westboro regarding our existing water and sewer contracts respectively. So that's the long list of articles that <coughs> staff may present to, to the board in the nearest future. <coughs> so do, uh, do I wait for Mr. Hur before we discuss, and do we want to discuss any of the um, <coughs> nuisance bylaw or any of that? Because he was the one that uh, brought that to our attention. It, <coughs> this is only my opinion, but in my opinion, the nuisance bylaw is a lower priority than the budget 
Um, <coughs> and so I would suggest that we go with a discussion on the nuisance bylaw before we do the budget if we don't have a full board. Okay. That's my opinion. I don't no, know. No, that's fine. No, that's, why, that's why I was asking opinions. Uh, Maybe we could have some discussion but hold off on a final vote in case Mr. Herr has mm -hmm. some input to it. Okay, and, and we don't have to finalize our. This is just the initial yeah, discussion. Of the initial <coughs> discussion. <coughs> because last year we did, um, it was uh, brought to my attention that we didn't uh, give this uh, bylaw enough, enough time. Enough time. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Kamala, we're kind of under the gun um, time wise. We can't um, move to put these two items to a different, to another meeting, right? The, the, the um, well, draft budget and capital plan. No. We're, we're too much under the budget to do that. I mean, under the gun. We can't wait for two weeks. For exactly. I, I think we, we need to get okay. started. Yeah. I, can, I think it's suggested the board can begin the discussion of the new nuisance bylaw. We have two options that may include it in the meeting target. Mr. Westerling. Yes, sir. Before your arrival, uh, the board wanted to went out and said thank you for the all the hard work you guys have done between water main breaks and snow removal and dealing with the adverse weather, so. Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I will pass that information along to the team. We appreciate it greatly. Excellent. Um, <coughs> Ms. Lanzos, can you take us through the um, nuisance bylaw since you uh, came through SAC with it and brought it to us, brought it to our attention? Yes. Um, so this evening what you have are two versions of, that are very similar. Um, at the discussion at the last meeting, it seemed as though there was a sense that perhaps um, the concern about seniors and others dealing with um, property could be, could be a burden. And so one of the versions removes or is intended to remove um, regulation of buildings. So it only deals with items, materials on property itself. And if someone has um, materials that are in the public view um, that fall under the definition of the nuisance in this provision, then there could be some enforcement action, which first step, in both of these, the first step would be just speaking with the director of municipal, municipal inspections. There's no punitive approach. It's a discussion about the items, and um, the intent is to resolve it uh, by moving the items inside or away from public view. Um, and if that does not work, then there's a procedure for fines and an appeal to the Board of Selectmen. So they're both similar in that respect. Um, the difference is that one addresses buildings along with the property and the other one does not. So where we had, if I may, um, where we had that discussion where the property owner came in and complained about certain <coughs> items of, of um, on, on their own, on, on the, on, not their property, on, on the person's property that owns it. If, you know, obviously the first line of defense would be to go and have a discussion with your neighbor. That's what Mr. Shepard brought up at uh, town meeting, you know, that today's society that's gone with uh, everybody wants to contact council and sue people. And so obviously you'd like your first your first line of defense would be, you know, a discussion and try to mediate it between the two property owners. But if, if, if say, uh, it went to the next level, where the uh, the building inspector or, or whomever went out and determined that it is falling in the nuisance um, parameters, they give them a certain amount of time to clean up. The, the refuse or the, the undesirable items. What's the follow-up? So I know that we had a, a, a fine schedule, but you know the twenty-five dollars to forty dollars to whatever. Is it a daily thing? Is it will follow up in six months? Is it follow up in a week, or is it up to the the inspector? It's up to the inspector. The we don't doesn't specify. Okay. I suppose depending on what it is, it could be easy to address or it could take some more time. Yep. So. It's right now. It doesn't specify. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, we had that come up in the in a Zach meeting when we were raising the fines, 
and I believe that um, we really don't find right now unless it's totally egregious. It's true. We try and work everything out, just like just like you said. That's right. I um I am a lot more comfortable with either of these from what we started out with, particularly <laughs> last year. Um, I have been concerned about issues with seniors. I've been concerned um, that this kind of a bylaw become used as a weapon for what really constitutes a neighbor problem. Um, and I like the fact that this provides for some lower level adjudication before you go to the fine structure. There's um, a lot of discretion allowed to the building inspector to really understand the situation and try to work out an amicable solution and um, to provide a measured response um, based, on, based on the circumstances. Um, I know I had, uh, I have been contacted by one citizen who asked if this would be something that could be, if the nuisance bylaw would cover something such as a problem with um, a boundary line issue, someone perhaps placing materials over the boundary on their property. Um, again, I, I don't think that's what this is supposed to do. I think what we want to do here is to really have a, a vehicle to address an, an egregious problem and address it in a reasonable manner, but that's exactly the kind of thing that has worried me about people wanting to use this type of a bylaw um, for a variety of, of neighbor issues. And um, I mean, am I correct, other members, that that's not where we want to be going with this, to be starting to get into people's the boundary. The and the McCoys, right. Yeah, bound, boundary yeah. things. I think there are other ways, but, but this, this shouldn't be it. Um, <laughs> I had two questions on this, Elaine. Um, when we talk about vacant buildings, uh, building the, the definition of building is, is very broad and seems to describe any kind of structure. But then when you get into vacant <coughs> buildings, um, what about an outbuilding? I, I mean, it's garage, people have garages and sheds and they're vacant. I mean, nobody lives there, but <coughs> Should, should something be worked into that language that addresses that this could be could be an outbuilding as as well, or do we? I, I'm just saying. I know this is a different quality. There's a different category of building between an occupied dwelling and a dwelling that's considered vacant or abandoned, but just an a shed. outbuilding. A shed that holds a lawnmower could be a vacant building. So we don't <coughs> ask them to bring. Well, I guess any old structure you can't. The bit about bringing them up to fire codes. Anything that's an older structure would be grandfathered anyway, so the fire code would be. So maybe if, if we proceeded with something that included the buildings, we might want to define what vacant is. Right, right. Because, but I mean, if it is a shed that's dilapidated and and creating a hazard with broken glass or whatever. Um, But is, is broken glass a <coughs> really a hazard? Yeah. yeah yep. I don't know. Yeah. Yep. It is. Because, first of all... My shed has windows only this big, though. <clears throat> well, I'm just going to get into this globally and not speak specifically. Oh, okay. Because <coughs> there may or may not be... Well, just, yeah, I'm going to speak globally. Uh, if a dilapidated shed <coughs> that may be close to your property line... Uh, on another person's property falls apart and those windows smash and go onto your property, the glass does not biodegrade. Um, so it, uh, it definitely, when it falls onto a person's lawn, uh, who may or may not have young children running on that lawn, uh, it definitely creates a hazard. Uh, oh, well, you may have misunderstood what I meant. <clears throat> I meant it's dilapidated, considered a broken window. Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Because this is where we have to get into yeah. some of the some of the definitions. This is some of the stuff that was, we were, we go over on Zach uh, all the time. <coughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. Right? 
All right, Mr. Herr, let's, uh, let's well, get here, buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's where there's a difference between is it just an eyesore to you or is it a hazard? You know, yeah. overgrown I mean, vegetation, you know what I mean? Like, this is overgrown vegetation. You know, it's like what's considered overgrown. Right, right, <clears throat> right. And I think that's where we have to defer to the professional standards that our building inspector or whatever we call them now, um, you know, they're the ones that would determine, um, you know, you may think that it's vegetation that's overgrown, but it may be a hay field that you know, there's someone bales of hay on a field or it, it needs to defer to someone's professional opinion that is a neutral party like, like a Mike Chucky Cadillac or Mike Shepard or someone like that that says, yeah, you know, you're, you're on College Street and you, you have a field that, that right. the, the grass is long. Well, yeah. Red Dwinell, uh is cuts it twice a year. Not anymore. I know. Um, or, um, you know, and I do think that as litigious as our society is today, we do need to defer to someone like Mike Shepard, Chuck Cadlick, people that are in that field that, that can differentiate between what's garbage and what isn't garbage, or what's safe and what isn't safe, yeah. and what's detrimental and what is not detrimental. Yeah. Now, what's what are the what's what's the difference between what we're looking at now and what was brought up last year? And I'm just asking that because I don't remember exactly what was brought up last year. Uh, a lot of was done with um, construction debris. Um, <coughs> oh, you mean as far as what was adopted last year, <coughs> or uh, yeah, this what was initially was? what was initially suggested? I know, I know, most of what was suggested was shot down. So a lot of what was in there was um, was based on the town of Upton's bylaw, which regulated a lot. It included it included maintaining your sidewalk, it included um, property maintenance, and so forth. So it was it was a much broader scope. So the scope of this has been narrowed down. And also the, um, the procedure for dealing with potential violations has changed a lot to working with people and having a punitive measure as a last resort versus punitive measure right out of the box. Right, right, okay. Um, you know, I mean, with, with this kind of thing, I always get concerned that, yeah, you know, one man's junk is another man's right. treasure, uh, you know. And, um, one person could say that there's a bunch of junk in someone's yard and then the person who owns that property say, no, that's a sculpture that I created. That's, that's artwork. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so I worry about something like that. Um, but I do see, I do see the value in, in the process that's being laid out here, you know, where hopefully that, that first person from town is uh, a neutral party who can come in and look at things objectively. As it progresses, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the board of selectmen is the group that should be, you know, kind of having the hearing in the end. And um, I mean, I'm open. I'm open to discussion on that, but I just don't. <coughs> well, the reason why, if I, if I may, uh, Mrs. Terry, the reason why I came to the board of selectmen, <coughs> it went through with zoning zoning advisor Biddy and went to planning board and at that at that level it can only be done in as a zoning article which is is not grandfathered and, and um well which has grandfathering so anybody that has no no, no 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 i'm talking oh. about i'm talking about the group that oversees any type of a hearing oh, so oh okay yes you would say oh i thought you were wondering why we were talking no about this. no okay. i'm just talking about the group that that has a hearing i mean you know we're not we're not um I don't know. I, you'll probably be able to give me five examples where I'm wrong, but I just don't see where we're that board that has a hearing to impose fines or not. Uh, could be, it could be anyone. Yeah. So, do we designate something, somebody for that? <laughs> Someone else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you could designate a hearing officer. We'll let Mr. Herr, yeah, the Mr. person Herr can who oversees it. So moved. Second. <laughs> And we're adjourned. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so we're um, discussing the nuisance bylaw. We came in just in time. Um, we, it's broken down into, into two sections. One, uh, Ms. Lazarus uh, wrote it up. So one is a, uh, 
uh, excludes buildings and one is uh, has uh, buildings included. Um, and there's a, a lot of definitions and of how to uh, break it down and, and how uh, uh, definitions of of, of uh, what is uh, what's a what's a structure, what debris is, what personal property, outdoor storage, and then the enforcement and, uh, and the offenses and penalties. Okay. And um, the bottom line being, it all starts with discussion starts and then goes with the director of municipal inspections going in there and trying to work things out uh, after a certain amount of time if things aren't worked out then it can get bumped up to a uh, hearing uh, what's written here is a hearing with the board of selectmen and at that point the board of selectmen can choose to impose a, fi a fine structure or fee structure not fees fines uh, I was saying I'm not sure that the Board of Selectmen is the appropriate group to have that hearing. Um, I, I have some concerns around different people's perceptions of what might be junk versus other things. Uh, but I think that this goes through and it's, uh, I think that there are enough, stu enough steps with neutral parties where uh, they'll be making some other judgments, and I think it, it's relatively safe in that area. I'm sure that you know there will be 50 people waiting at the microphone to poke holes in that at town meeting. But um, again, my my other thing though being, I'm not sure if the board of selectmen is the right group to have that hearing. So have we decided on whether buildings would be included or not or no we actually just started talking about it <clears throat> and we got to the point uh, that uh, mr. Sestari just said you know who's the uh, overseeing board you know, who, you know it, it's us or do we designate it and that's just when you walked in and I'm trying not to speak too much yeah so it's always tough to catch up to a meeting right you just don't exactly. have a flavor of what's going on uh, a couple of quick thoughts one I'm not a big fan of the buildings one I don't know a whole lot about the buildings one but I thought we were always sort of talking about lots and stuff outside and things I mean if, if we want to get into buildings that's fine too I think it's a second sort of level up in terms of exterior maintenance I guess is what we're talking about to some extent um, we're sure as heck not gonna go inside and start talking about the color of the dining room versus the living room right yeah. uh, Two, um, I just think an elected board should be involved in these hearings, whoever that is. Uh, I'm, I'm open to that, but I think elected folks should be the ones that are representing the community and hear the complaints or whatever it is, however it gets processed through. Um, you know, elections have consequences, so this would be one of them. I have two comments. Um, I was kind of thinking in favor of the building's inclusion um, because we have heard of some existing issues where buildings themselves are a problem or if they're leaning or about to fall over. Um, and I'm not sure whether this would apply or not, but um, I am concerned about situations where you can have a building that is, because it's not maintained, it deteriorates to the point that now it has to be demolished for want of care. Um, in particular, for instance, um, that building now that is part of the Legacy Farms property, which is, I'm going to say it might be 81 or 83 East Main Street. It's the house that's on the triangle, where it used to be the triangle where the Peach Street came in. And um, I know there are some broken windows there. There have been doorway <coughs> doors hanging open for a while. I think now that's been shut. but. Um, when we made the host community agreement, it was designated that that house should be preserved and reused in some way or shape, and there's been no purpose for that building right now, and I've seen deterioration and uh, with a concern that you may get to the point of demo, what you would call demolition by neglect. You just let a building deteriorate, and then it has to be demolished because stuff like a broken window or doorways that are left ajar or you know so I'm thinking this kind of a bylaw would um, give the town some kind of ability to ask for corrections when there's a building that's just being allowed to 
deteriorate for want of for want of basic maintenance. Um, so that and and I also w wanted to mention the bit about the junk piled on someone's property. Where is it? It's on the second page, item G, outdoor storage accumulation of junk. It says. Um, Machinery or motor vehicles, blah, 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 regardless of whether or not the same could be put to any reasonable use. And I know there are some people in town that do small engine repair, work on, work on cars or work on small engines. And, you know, I've seen various stuff sitting out there and it is kind of unsightly, but it is some kind of a small business that they run whether perhaps there could be some clause put in there that said, you know, if used in the in the um, operation of of a business uh, situation could be remedi maybe remediated by either um, screening or enclosure to screen from public view. Public view is really the issue on some of these. It's not. With some of the buildings, it might be a hazard, but with some of these, it's more public view. And if somebody uses this on their property for a business, we shouldn't be able to tell them we have to get rid of it because it's ugly. The issue is screening it from view. So I, I don't want to um, prohibit somebody's either hobby or small business if it involves maybe small engine repair or something. <coughs> See, for me, I'm afraid that this might give my wife some fodder. Because I had an old, my old uh, snow blower in front of my garage for the last two weeks. Wow. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> uh, I think one of your neighbors. <laughs> I think the I guy across the street said something about it to me. I moved it already too. today. <laughs> Between that and neighbors snow blowing your front yard, I don't know. Well, I think we got some good input. Um, you know, maybe we can we'll come up with a combined copy and see what we've got. Um, so I, I'm 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 for leaving buildings out for right now. I, I, I'm taking baby steps <clears throat> to see what what we can, what most people can agree to. <clears throat> because last year when we tried putting it through, we ended up with just the construction. You know, if we can take us take some baby steps here and and. <coughs> try to uh, uh, tighten it up a little bit more and see what the town has an appetite for because um, I don't know if people are, are ready to mm -hmm. subject their yards to the rest of the town's thoughts on whether or not it's, uh, it's presentable. Yeah. There are existing uh, building codes and so forth that address vacant buildings so I can look <coughs> into what that covers regardless of a bylaw. Oh great. Is this referencing all property or only property visible from someone else's property? I believe it's all property. Depending on what it is, I think. Good At question. some point it talks about, um, some of the items talk about uh, being visible and some do not in the list of items. But it, it could be <coughs> that consistent. Okay, well, we'd probably move on to uh, uh, budget stuff now that we have Mr. Herr. <clears throat> okay, um, let's, uh, let's go back to the um, item number 10. The uh, board's talking about receiving an update from town manager on the post uh, 2019 operating capital budget. <clears throat> draw the board's attention to the email that I sent with the, sent to the board uh, yesterday uh, and as I was preparing for this conversation I, I kept going back to a couple of things number one uh, what what is the most straightforward way of presenting the, the budget request information uh, as well as um, how that uh, balances alongside the town's revenues. 
and I went went back to the file that is uh, entitled the calculator. It's the one that lists the different components of the budget uh, for FY17, as was approved at town meeting. FY18, and then it shows the percentage change. Uh, and at the bottom of that worksheet, uh, we do identify the tax impact as well as the excess levy capacity. You'll notice that uh, if you compare this format with the one that was presented by Chris before, uh, I did add a few things at the bottom, um, specifically the excess levy capacity, because I believe that's an item of interest to the board. So do you, are you all looking at that worksheet? Because I just want to walk you through that very simplified presentation of the budget. Yes. Do you happen to have a copy of that worksheet? I don't have a copy of that either. I don't think that I got that. Yeah, it came yesterday. I got the email, but uh, yeah, the yeah, so copy there. Yes, is that what you look? That it? It is my notes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, it's a public <laughs> document. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can share. We I can can't read share. the chicken scratch anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, All right, I'm good. How about Brendan? Are you all set? Let me see. I'll take a picture of it. I'll peruse it. <coughs> Okay, um, let me start off with the top part. Uh, if you go right at the uh, bottom of the first segment, the one that begins with general government and ends with park and rec subsidy. <coughs> the number to point out is the $84 million number under FY19 requested mm -hmm. operating budget. That is the extent of the requests that translate to the town's FY19 requested operating budget. And then the next section, beginning with pay as you go capital and ending with transfer to the OPEP trust. Those are additional expenses that come along with the requests that have been proposed or brought forth to the town manager's attention. I should point out the pay-as-you-go capital number, which is 1.2380122 cents, is suggested to be paid for out of free cash. That's why when you look further down, under the revenue section, which is the last part, that number is also included and it zeroes out, or evens out, sorry. In terms of local revenues, this is the information that we reviewed previously and was presented by the finance director. It covers the local revenue, state aid, MSBA construction reimbursement, appropriations from free cash, other available funds, and the direct and indirect costs associated with our enterprise funds, including sewer, water, park and rec enterprise. And so, here's how I suggest you look at these numbers. The key is to understand the extent of the operating budget, which is the $84 million number, under the FY19 requested amounts, the additional expenses of $2.6 million, and then balance that with the tax levy limit, which is listed as $71 million, 
which in fact is the number that you get when you separate eight, when you subtract 84, which is the eight, the operating budget, uh, subtract the 15 million um, number, which is the available funds. And built into that, which is why I included the last line, if you go down to the excess levy capacity, that in itself, if you look at the levy limit minus the tax levy, which is the impact of the operating budget plus the other expenses in columns <coughs> in, in the groupings one and two, uh, we identify what I believe uh, and would like to term as the funding capacity constraint or gap. And our gap at this point, given the request that had been put forth uh, and presented to the town manager is approximately $2.7 million. How did we get here? Uh, here's what I have heard uh, from my conversations with different stakeholders, department heads, boards, and committees. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. As we're explaining how did we get here, just a little more precise on where we are when we're here. Uh, how much additional spending from last year to this proposal was required to get to this negative excess levy capacity? We're looking at an additional uh, growth uh, in expenditures of approximately $7 million. $7 million. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I think also there's a reason why I in fact, that's a very good question. There's a reason why I also presented the FY17 and FY18 numbers. You would notice that when, 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 when the town approved the FY18 budget, uh, that represented at least an increase in the operating budget of approximately $10 million, mm -hmm. which was higher than what we're looking at this year. However, the impact on the taxpayers back then was not as substantial as what we're looking at now because of several factors. We had a higher amount of new growth, mm -hmm. we had a higher amount of free cash, and we also had a substantial amount of other available funding sources. That's the reason why I'm presenting tonight's issue as a funding capacity constraint or gap. In terms of how we got here, here's what I've gathered from my conversations with different stakeholders, <coughs> boards and committees, department heads, and so forth. Uh, number one, we are a growing community. Uh, clearly, the numbers show it uh, in terms of the demands on our services. Uh, the town also recently invested in uh, building infrastructure uh, relative to the schools, the library, and DPW. Uh, clearly, uh, the cost of running this new infrastructure is substantially higher than the facilities that were replaced. And then thirdly, I have also uh, gathered from my conversations with uh, the different stakeholders that this may be an odd year. It may be an odd year uh, in the sense that uh, the, 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 the cost of the services may actually uh, be auto-correcting. Uh, why I say auto-correcting uh, is because uh, for example, if you look at the infrastructure or the buildings that we approved, these are items that the town has been discussing for uh, several years. We discussed the school for many years, discussed the library for many years, discussed the DPW building for many years before um, these facilities were actually approved at town meeting. Uh, during those discussions, did we actually document what we're looking at now? Um, I don't believe we did uh, to the exact dollar. Uh, uh, and what that points, that what that means for me at least is uh, the need for us to, 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 to be better uh, when we're doing our demand, uh, our service demand sensing. In other words, how do we predict future demand when 
who are looking at a capital project that is coming online. <coughs> so I don't have an answer as to whether this is an auto-correction. I think this will require an extended discussion amongst all the stakeholders. Uh, and therefore, I think put simply, what we're looking at, what we're looking at is there's a, we're a growing community. We have infrastructure that we have invested in that we now have to program out. Uh, and then thirdly, this may be an odd year, and we need to do further analysis in terms of whether this is an auto correction or not. Um, with that in place, what I'm now looking for in terms of tonight's discussion is for the board at least to give us guidance on how to proceed. I think as has been said, it needs to be said over and over. We have said this over the years. We are one town, and we're looking for one solution. I am expecting that all of us <coughs> together towns and also our colleagues on the school side will roll up our sleeves and look at how we can address the funding capacity constraint or gap that is before <coughs> us today. And I can answer any questions that the board may have. And again, I'm hoping that through this discussion there will be clarity in terms of what we do tomorrow in terms of moving the budget process forward. Oh, Mr. Kimmel, can you answer? There's a line item here that that's called amount certified for tax title, and across the board, it's been budgeted pretty consistently at fifty thousand dollars. And then in this sheet that we have here, all of a sudden, it's jumped up to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it's a percent increase of eleven thousand three hundred and forty-six point one six percent increase. What what is that? Yeah, um, the number that you see, in effect, in the spreadsheet that I said, I did highlight it in yellow. We are continuing to review this number. What is reflected currently is the S and I deficit. That is the snow and ice deficit. Uh -huh. The number that was shared with us is that from last year, we have to appropriate $450,000 to address that. So we, <coughs> oh, so we've always budgeted that at about 50000 because you purposely budgeted it low. Yeah. with the understanding that you can pay for that out of free cash, usually. Usually, we, in the past, we were able to do that. Um, so, even though we budgeted at 50, it's now 450. Okay. Yes. I, I just wondered what was such a huge jump. It's just certified for tax title. I wasn't sure what that was. In, in fact, if I may, that, that's a good question, too, from the sense that, um, and one of the reasons I highlighted it is that, is that under the current municipal modernization law, the town has the ability to appropriate this number over an extended period of time beyond the, um, the one year limit that we had previously, uh, mm. but clearly with, with some conditions. Mm. So that, that's why this could be a number that we're watching going forward. It may change. <coughs> okay. on, these, on these columns, the percent change I'm seeing that the percent change is just hard coded in there as opposed to a calculation from the prior two years. And the hard coded numbers are not anywhere near what I'm calculating. You know, general government, for example, you're going from 3.6 million roughly up to 4 million. You know, and it says that there was a 2% change from 17 to 18. Well, that's about an 11% change there. So I'm just trying to figure out how these calculations happen. Yeah, in, in fact, please disregard the first percentage change column. Okay. Yeah, we, I thought we had, I thought I had hidden that, that, that column. <laughs> 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 yeah, please disregard that one. If we could yeah. afford it, we'd send you to the Excel spreadsheet class. Well, yeah. that wasn't, no, that was, that was the number, those yeah. were the numbers that we, yeah. Um, we took a st we took a vote on and decided that that's where we were going to hold the uh, the town uh, to two percent and three and a half for the schools. Yeah. I think that was back in October. Exactly. Yeah, th th that's the number that we had used when we when the board considered the budget message. And that was our budget message. Yeah. But the so back speaking of back in October when we were coming up with the budget message. When we were coming up with that budget message, one of my questions to you and our finance director was, what number increase would it take for us to get to a point of requiring an override? And I got chuckles from our finance director and a smile from you 
yeah. both of you saying there's no way we can get to a point requiring an override. That would require so much of an increase, it's not going to happen. You don't need to worry about that. And yet, you know, we can we can give it any fancy name or acronym we want, but when I see a negative excess levy capacity in the bottom line, to me that says that if we go forward the way we are right now, we're looking at an override. So <coughs> what changed from October to now? Mr. Sestali, that's a good, good, uh, good observation. In fact, um, back in October, I really did not see this coming. I did not see the, the demands for service coming at the levels uh, at which they did. Um, we, we didn't see this coming. I did not see this coming. Um, I have asked around um, <coughs> other area towns, other area town <coughs> managers, uh, if they've seen 7% uh, increases in budgets, and they have not. However, I also do realize that there are a few other towns that are adding um, over 1,000 units uh, in the community. Uh, but you are absolutely correct. We were wrong back in October. Okay. Well, that's not as much fun when you just admit that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so what, what can we do about it now? Uh, so we see these numbers, you know, these, this is a first pass as far as I'm concerned. It's certainly not anything that, uh, I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to know a lot more detail, uh, in order to cast a vote to say, yeah, this is what I want to go in front of town meeting with. Um, you know, in the past we've, we've gone through exercises where we've said, all right, the, the major changes from one year to another, we want to see them. We want to see them quantified in terms of, you know, how much extra money are we spending? If that money is felt that it's going to be invest, an investment that results in savings, uh, you know, what are we cutting out? What are we adding? You know, what's the difference so that we can decide, okay, you know, what do we really value at this point? In the past, it was a lot easier because we didn't have to ask for any type of an override. Uh, when we start looking at this situation, I fully acknowledge the fact that, yes, you know, when you have a growing population, you need to be able to deliver those services. We need to keep those services at, you know, the same level we always have, if not higher. But we, then we need to make a decision, is that extra cost worth delivering it higher? So, you know, the, the major services, you know, obviously we value our schools and the value they bring to town and our property values, uh, but we can't ignore police, fire, DPW, it's, you know, they're kind of, they're more of the unsung heroes. And for us to, you know, just, you know, shove that to the background would be, you know, quite frankly, a little bit ignorant of us. So what's, what's the next step here in terms of uh, bringing more visibility to what we're looking at? I, I think that you're kind of trying to get some direction tonight in terms of, here it is, is this something we can live with? But in my mind, we don't have enough information to determine, you know, can we live with this? Mm -hmm. uh, you hope that when your population is increasing and you have to expand your services, uh, you hope that the services on a, you know, on a per person basis cost roughly the same as they did before to keep the same level. Uh, understanding that every now and then you gotta add You've got to add uh, uh, some new some new capital here and there, and so that might that might add some cost. But um, <coughs> if we're adding people to the fire department, uh, you know, well, we got a lot more people paying in. So you know, we're hoping our tax number, our our, our levy, is staying about the same per per person or per household. So you know, what's what's that? additional information that we can chew on or should we be waiting till the next meeting for that yeah um, what I also included in the email I sent to the board um, was an explanation of the budget drivers and that's the word document right? do, you, do you all have access mm -hmm. to that word document I just gave it to uh, Brendan yeah. um, 
what, what that does is it, it identifies the change from 18 to 19 in dollar terms, and then it breaks down the major components of, of, of that change. For example, under general government, uh, the exact change is 303,725 uh, from 18 to the 19 requests. And the key drivers behind that 303,000 include appraisal services, the need for a procurement officer, network administrator, elections and registration, land use staffing, and also contracted services under land use. So my suggestion is uh, the board can spend time going through those drivers. Um, and at a future meeting, uh, we, we, we can decide on <coughs> what you believe should be the priority. Uh, again, what, what I'm looking for is some direction on how we can proceed. Uh, everybody understands the, the funding capacity constraint or gap that we have to address. Um, is given given your past experience and looking at the number, <laughs> looking at the. So, so if yeah. I may, what you're asking yeah. for is the funding gap a movable object or an immovable object? Correct. But that's about as simple as I can put it. Yeah. I think that when we're at town meeting. Number seven is something that should go up to everybody at town meeting so that they can see the change in our debt service yeah. from fiscal 17 to 19. It's more than tripled from yeah. just under three million to over nine million dollars. And it's not a it's not a complaint, but you know, this is this is when everything starts coming to roost, everything that we've been voting on for the last, you know, two, three, four years. And you know, certainly there's a lot of benefit that's come to the town with our new library and school and DPW building. Um, but you know, there's also other things that we vote on. <clears throat> and eventually it all comes to roost and starts piling up right in this little bucket. Um, and that's, that's a pretty significant change uh, going from under three million to over nine million in two years for our debt service. And year over year, it's 1.5. So of the 7 million that's on this piece of paper today, we're down to 5.5 five if we didn't have that at added debt service. Yeah. Right? So it's a big chunk of the 7 million that shows this 2 7 gap right now. What's yeah. 3 million of it? Yeah. <clears throat> it's um, yeah, $2,945,000 is debt service. Yeah. But year over year, it's 1 4, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. but 1 7. One yeah. seven. Yeah. So who's up? Am I up? Sure. Um, so a couple of thoughts sort of directionally about where I think we need to go as one person, one member. Uh, that 2-7 has to go away. Okay, the word that mentioned at the other end of the table has to go away. Um, I just don't think that that's fair to all of us in the community uh, to, to, go, to think about even going down that path. I'm sorry, I, 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 didn't, I don't know what you were talking about when you say that 2-7. The 2.7 gap. The okay. Very, okay. So Thank the 2.7 gap and that word gotcha. that begins with an O yep. and ends in ride has to go away, right? That's the same thing. Um, so we have to figure that out. That's I, I, that I think is what our immediate goal is for the next two months before we get ready for town meeting is how can we close this gap? Um, a quick eyeball um, <clears throat> and having sat in on all the budget presentations for the schools. Uh, we have wants, we have needs, we have all these new assets that we need to staff, and we have a budget. So we've got to, I think we're going to have to do some work with our colleagues in town, other elected officials, and do some $100,000 and above assessments of line item by line item. You know, and start there and then kind of work our way down if we have to. Um, but we simply can't take that to the taxpayers. So I, I think some kind of working session where we get into the nitty gritty by line item uh, needs to take place. And uh, we have to sort of ferret out what is a want that we can hold off on for a future year, what is an absolute need, 
and what is a need that may have to wait for another year as we staff up these facilities like we can't do it all at once and that's really what we're doing right now is we've got a lot of stuff happening at once but we can't tax at once it's just not fair so you know we're not even talking about the fact that we're going into that excess levy that excess levy folks is raising the tax rate mm -hmm. that is an override already because right. that's over two and a half right yeah. so um, I knew that this was going to be the year with the debt service coming on and all the new buildings coming online and the staffing requests that we were probably gonna have to chip into that but to reset the clock on the hard work we've done for the last 10 years in town with fiscal discipline uh, by going for this trying to add another 2.7 on top of all that I just think is I think after all the hard work we've done through a very difficult recession and everything else to where we are today I just don't think that's appropriate that's appropriate so I think that's where we have to begin is sitting down with our colleagues and doing some line item work. We've done this in the past during very difficult years. We sat in the fire station uh, one day for six or seven hours and it was ugly, but it had to happen because we are all in it together. Uh, Mr. Brown, did I understand you correctly that um, all these pay you should go expenses, which amount to about 1.2 million, those are all be coming from the uh, free cash at the moment that's the suggestion now I mean I understand that it's frowned upon to use free cash for general operating expenses the thought being that you should you should be making a work your budget so that you're covering your expenses and you use that free cash for extras or one times but is that a total requirement? I mean, I, I am looking at a whole list of pay-as-you-go things that are eating up $1.2 million in, in resources that would go a long way to reducing that 2.7, and maybe some of them are absolutely required, but maybe some of them aren't. I mean, we've got dishwashers. No, I know we're not going to get, we, get, we can't get into the... I know, right, I know we're point, not going to though. get into individuals. <clears throat> I'm just saying, you know, um, how much of these are absolute necessities? Can can we take some of that? <clears throat> 1.2 million is, is a big piece of change when we're looking at a 2.7 shortfall. There, there is a reluctance to use free cash for sort of year after year expense Understood. management, right? Understood. But free cash is an always, I shouldn't say always, free cash happens pretty regularly in any municipal finance arrangement. Um, so we're always gonna have free cash. The question is how much of that is free cash? Generally, we always have free cash. I mean, in theory, it could ha not happen, but we always do. And we always talk about free cash mm -hmm. and not using it. But every year, we get free cash certified from the prior year, which is a good thing because we manage tight. Just because we set the budget doesn't mean, say, go spend it. Mm -hmm. Set the budget, manage tight, and see what turns up at the end of the year. I'm okay with using free cash in a different way in the year that we're putting all these other assets into play. As long as it's not you know, a For me, it's, it's a savings of these buildings. It's bricks and mortar. The bricks and mortar that we're putting in this year is our savings account because it's assets that's raising the net value of the town. So we have to think differently in this year as we put all this stuff in place. Like the 1.2 million free cash, if it's for a bunch of stuff that we probably don't need, but we want, or it's part of a routine schedule we've been sticking to during the good times here the last few years, well, that schedule is going to have to go on hold while we put all this other stuff online. That's, that's where we're putting our savings and our bricks and mortar money. But in actuality, last year we actually put some stuff on hold so we could hold the... Um, budget increase to mm -hmm. 3% and we took a whole bunch of stuff off the uh, off the table. And isn't and it fascinating that probably none of us can name what we put on hold? I know that we Police did. cars. And, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We always get police cars. And pavement, yeah. and pavement Just go get as many as they want. <clears throat> pavement management, sidewalks, uh, we yeah. did, we, we, yeah. we hit the DPW hard yeah. last year. And we said we would, we would take care of sidewalks and pavement management again this year. We, can't, we cannot do it all. But then we, you know, so we have, that's why we have to be careful uh, that we don't hit the same things two years or three years in a row. <coughs> Just because they're easy and people don't really notice, see them that much. Maintenance is very important because if you don't maintain things, then you've got to replace them. I, th I, think, I, I think the ultimate, and this is probably want to get into this now, but I think the ultimate decision when it comes to budget and fixing something like this, which is pretty extensive. We've had some tough years in the past, and we figured it out. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were 2.7, but we've had some million-dollar deals or million-dollar issues in the past, if not more than that. But the ultimate question is, where do we get the best return on investment for the taxpayers and residents of Hopkinton with the money we have to spend? And sometimes the answer to that people don't like to hear. 
but that's what we have to focus on in a situation like this. They're getting a great return on investment with a new DPW facility, mm -hmm. a new school, a new library. Uh, what am I forgetting? So we're getting some really good return on investments already with bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. Now, where's the rest of the money go? It continues that return on investment. But those are choices that were already made. Those aren't on the table for now. Right, but funding all the other stuff that most people want to go with those now is what we have to look at. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of this money is. A lot of this is filling in the program, to Mr. Kamal's point earlier, filling in the program to go with the new assets. <clears throat> and maybe some of those programs are just going to have to, we're going to have to ease into the programs instead of going full bore because, you know, we only have a limited amount of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Is everybody comfortable with uh, moving on to uh, budget and capital hearings? Did you get uh, the direction you're looking for? <laughs> well, actually, I thought we just did that we're going to. <laughs> <coughs> that, that, it, it, you know. So, I think Mr. That, Herr, yeah. when you speak of that time that you guys hashed it out at the fire station for six hours, who, <coughs> who was part of that? Because it, it's... To sit here, so I feel like I'm a little bit at a disadvantage because you guys have been here for nine years and you've been through this process and I'm trying to get brought up to speed. But it's easy right here to say, <clears throat> you know, we, maybe we can cut here, maybe we can cut. But unless we have all the players arguing pros and cons in the room, it's hard like if we, I mean the elephant in the room is the schools. The schools is gonna take up the, the biggest part of our budget. So if we don't have the school committee here, fighting for what they want and the fire department and the police and the DPW and the f garden club, whoever, whoever's trying to get money out of us to, to kind of uh, triage, if you will, where our want versus need comes. Like, um, you know, the new school may say, we need to have Crayola brand crayons. Whereas the fire chief may say, well, no, actually, we need a new defib to save people's life. Whereas the DPW would say, you know, we need a stainless steel water bottle for every employee. You know, like, you have to de decide the want versus need, but everybody's got to have their opinion put in at the same time. And I can see where it would get ugly, and I'm not opposed to that, but it has to be a level playing ground. We can't decide right here without representation from every department that we have the ability to pull this from. And, that, and, that, and if I may, that, that, that can be true. <clears throat> now, when we're talking about the schools, we, that's why we give a number. And they take care of their budget. They decide where the cuts are going to be. We don't say to them, no, you can't. You know, we're cutting your program here. We're only going to fund five classrooms. They decide where all that happens. And, and the same thing with, you know, with the other departments. That's why the department heads, but we know we can discuss it with the other departments. But when it comes to the schools, you know, that's one of the things that I had a discussion with the uh, the, uh, the chair uh, with Gene earlier, and and they pa as I said earlier they passed their budget because they ha they had to to meet the deadline. Yeah. And um, the school committee does understand that that uh, we do have a lot of work to do, and we're going and they're going to do their best because they understand that uh, bringing this to, to the to to the uh, town meeting is is, is going to be uh, um, quite difficult. So if we set a number, and I thought that we set a number at three percent or or whatever that was, three and a half percent. Yeah, that was that's that's ten o'clock. So that if we set if we set that number, why are we getting budgets given to us that are higher than that? Because well, that's and that's the whole thing about things that have changed since October. And so there's another attachment in here, in one of the emails that. Uh, mm -hmm. The school committee sent explaining some of their no, budget drivers and yep, things like I that. Saw that. So, just like we had things that we didn't predict, they had things yep. that they didn't predict. Um, so, you know, this is the point. This is the point where uh, you know we need to we need to work with the schools. I think that both sides need to come up with some target mm -hmm. to get to. Um, you know, I I for the most part agree with Mr. Her. You know, I do not want to be. Uh, you know, wow. it happens. Two worlds colliding right there. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to be the board that's uh, that's you know bringing an override to the table uh, mm -hmm. at town meeting. Um, but 
on the other hand, you know, we might we might sit down and we might go through everything on both sides and find that, you know what, you know, maybe maybe this is the year we need to make an exception and we need to present it to people. I will say that had had our board not put underrides out a couple of times over the last five years, then this is a budget that we could, you know, send through without requesting an override and nobody would think twice. They'd say, well, it's going up a lot, but you know, they wouldn't have to take that second vote for an override, so it wouldn't trigger that, that response. Mm -hmm. I'm not regretting that we put through the underrides because that was the purpose as far as I was concerned, was to create more transparency so that when we hit a situation like this, people would recognize it. And it would be kind of a pressure switch where people now they have to start taking a look and they have to start thinking about all right, what do we want to spend our money on? So as far as I'm concerned, it's it's worked out the way it should. Mm -hmm. um, and we and kept it, money in people's pockets for four years. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and now it's time for our board and the school committee to start looking at things and making a few more difficult decisions in determining what we're willing to put in front of town meeting. Uh, and then at that point, getting in front of town meeting and standing behind it, whether it includes an override or not. So to your question, Brendan, we had the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and I believe um, the two chiefs given their strong chief position, and I think that was it in the meeting, along with the town manager mm -hmm. um, and the CFO. Does that sound about right? I think so. I don't remember though whether whether the chiefs were present or not. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. a pretty big group. Yeah, we room. can't have 50 people in there. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. we still we still had about 20 or so anyway. Oh yeah, there was a full yeah. long full table yeah. round table yeah. Yeah. discussion. But, but something like that, or perhaps the DPW director. I don't know. However, we figure all that out. And, but we can't have everybody. We don't not. We, but you know the key players need to be there one we one thing we could do is we could vote tonight i could make a motion right now that says i move it we scratch you know 300 grand from this but line 300 and just go right down and name numbers and all that's going to do is infuriate everybody so and in the past we've done it a couple of times we're like no we only get you know this number and that's i don't think the way to go so um, I'd rather talk it through, and we all make joint decisions. Right. And I will. I will that say that came before, up with a million and a half bucks just by going yeah. to the lab. You know? But even you know, I would I would expect that going into a meeting like that, then both sides would be looking for other, you know, I'll say creative solutions, but things that you know you see I know in the corporate world all the time, in terms of some of the staffing. And so I see a department here getting four new people. Well, are they all going to be hired on July 1st? No, they're not. So, you know, if you trickle them out through the year and say one per quarter or, exactly. you know, two of them in September and then another two in March, you know, you can start cutting $100,000 there, you know, or something like that. It does come around for the next year for the operating budget, but at least it, it's getting, helping get us by this year. Um, so I would expect things like that to happen before that meeting so that we get a revised number. And now instead of 2.7 million, maybe we're looking at 2 million, you know, and then we can start looking at some of those $100,000 items like Mr. Hur was mentioning. One thing that does concern me is that our number's at 2.7, and I am noticing that uh, we've taken away any contribution to OPEB and general stabilization. Um, I'm not sure what our stabilization fund is at right now and how it compares to any metric, but I know that for OPEB, you know, really our plan was to continue putting money in there every year. Uh, so that's something where as much as we're trying to cut, I want to see money added into there. <laughs> so, um, you know, but, but there's all these pulling forces, right? I think stabilization is north of $3 million now, isn't it? Yeah, 3.2 3 million. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So... So I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, we definitely need to keep putting money into that. But but, but to your point, how's that OPEB, ratio for bond rating? We were almost there. We're almost there, but we're still below the I think the the five percent that we we're, 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 we're shooting for. I think in the past we <laughs> not after this budget. <laughs> <laughs> but we're at AAA plus now, correct? Yes, we are. Um, 
So we're there, but but we've been building there. If we kind of level off for a year, I think we just got to let them know. Uh, you know, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But this is the kind of stuff we got to get into. Right. This really good. So, Mr. Gamalo, if you would, let's let's look at um, putting a uh, a meeting together at the, the, another uh, fire station type meeting, mm -hmm. whether it be at the uh, at 80 South Street or at uh, the fire station. Let's uh, decide. Yeah. So here's the only little snafu with that. I have, I cannot do the weekends through now till the end of March. I'm sorry, I just can't. I got obligations with kids outside the house, living elsewhere, etc. So um, this has to be a late night gig. <laughs> That's my preference too. <laughs> but me too, because people tend to want to finish up at a certain hour. They get a little punchy <laughs> sometimes. Well, on the punchy line, maybe we could do it on the hockey rink. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we started early, if you we bring started, your slippers. <laughs> Do a stand-up meeting. If we started at five, you know, and then, you know, whatever, get some pizzas for people, you know, so that they're there. Yeah, if we go five to ten. And we have to do it another night. We can get. It. Right. I think we'd be, we'd be all right. Right. But we have to ask our colleagues if that's okay too. Right. Just, I know weekends are tough, <clears throat> but for me personally, and I apologize. I just I have to pick somebody mm -hmm. up Friday night at five o'clock. That's why mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's understandable. Yep. I mean, we're, we're all volunteers, and we're doing the best we can. So we so we get that. Okay. All right. You have enough guidance. Mm -hmm. Setting up a meeting. Yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. But your capital. Um, can, can I ask other, one other question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mr. Kamalo, are there other things that we're starting to look at too? Um, you know, some of the things that have been discussed that are driving the budget increases, I don't see as necessarily being um, steady from year to year. So some of the unpredictable components. Are there other things that we're looking at so that any of these, any of these items that fluctuate from year to year, uh, are there ways to pull it out of the operating budget uh, so that it's not used as part of that base for our 2.5% increases each year? I'm not saying that it's not stuff that we shouldn't fund or can't fund or anything like that, but just so that it's not in the base that's used for our increases annually. Um, yes, two thoughts. One is going back to previous town meeting appropriations that have not been expanded. Uh, we did that last year, identified a sizable chunk of money that then funded the operating budget, um, I, I would like us to, to revisit that process. Uh, for example, we could look at uh, articles that were approved as capital articles by town meeting many years ago that have not been uh, expended, or uh, remaining balances in some of the capital articles previously uh, approved. Does that just go back into the general fund? I, I think in this <coughs> case specifically, we, we will as town meeting to reappropriate that money for specific purposes. Okay. Yeah. So this is more, more change in the sofa. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Wouldn't that impact the tax rate though? Still. Yeah. It's already. It's already been. It's corrected. already been taxed. Yeah. It's old money. It's old yeah. money. So it's even money. There's even if they were borrowing specific to a project. It, some of the money may already have been borrowed. We did that last year, and we identified some, some funds that we then applied to the operating budget in that regard. And then number two, uh, specific to your question, uh, the, the uh, new regulations that, it, that were actually that were put forth as part of the municipal modernization law, uh, specifically identifying uh, transportation, <coughs> Out of district uh, uh, tuition and spared as items that could be pulled off from the budget, put in a reserve account that is overseen by both the selectmen and the school committee. Okay, so those are all school things. Yes. Um, and that would pull it out of the kind of bottom line of the operating budget so that when we're looking year over year and saying, okay, we time to add another two and a half percent. It's not, it's not being built in there? Um, I wouldn't say it pulls it out of the 
base overall budget, but it's identified as separate from the overall school, for example, the school budget. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of this is also because we've had a drop in revenue too in some areas. Um, should we be reexamining some of our of our fees? Um, as, as part of the budget message, we always ask departments to look at their revenue sources, mm -hmm. update their fees if necessary, mm -hmm. uh, and there are departments that have identified the potential for increasing fees, mm -hmm. uh, though remaining sensitive that um, we do not raise the fees substantially. Well, I mean, not necessarily fees on citizens, but some of the fees that are generated by development, <coughs> permitting permits and things. I mean, maybe they haven't been updated in a couple of years just keeping up with current prices, or Hopkinton's a desirable town. If you raise some of the fees for some of the services, I don't think builders are not going to build here because they have to pay a little bit more for a permit. We we did that um, a couple of years ago, last year maybe. Yep. We, we took a look at the fees, and I know that Mr. Kamala says that they do look at them periodically. Mm -hmm. But one of the limitations is, uh, by law, we can only charge uh, what it costs us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have, to, we have to take a look at what the processing fee is, this person's time, that person's time, mm -hmm. and come up with an estimate of mm -hmm. what the cost mm -hmm. is to process that application or mm -hmm. whatever. And, um, and that's the limit of what we can charge. The governments are not allowed to make a profit. Yeah, no, but I do know that a, a substantial source of revenue has been from some of the fees for new construction. There are types of permits that were being issued that, because of legacy and the muse that resulted in a substantial amount of income from the well, we new construction. We raised the, the, Those the, types of fees. the water hookup fee to like no. $4,500. Oh. <coughs> we, well, we raised the... Um, uh, alcohol licenses, no alcohol licenses, thirty-five hundred, right. and, and many, many of the restaurant tourists were mm -hmm. complaining. Mm -hmm. that no, no, does no. it really cost thirty-five hundred dollars yeah. to yeah. Uh, to process a, a liquor license? Right. No, I thought they were more from new construction. That well, I think. Yeah. Sorry. So a question I had, uh, building off of what Mrs. Wright said. So when we spoke about the fines for let's say watering your lawn and it was what 25 bucks or something like that, that. Um, <coughs> if you I guess it's hard to quantify what it costs because what if you're what if you watered your lawn for ran the sprinklers for 24 hours a day for eight weeks and you got caught so if you're you know, it's a lot more than 25 dollars that, that that uh, between the man hours of of, uh, of creating the, the document and, and finding them and postage and what about all the water used and, and um, you know if we figure out how much water you use versus what we have to pay for Milford or Westboro or wherever we're getting our water from, it's a lot more than twenty five bucks. It is. But they're so, paying for their water. But they're not supposed to be using it. I, I understood. understood. For watering the. But I think, but right now, we're, right now, we're really. Actually, I, I think. Guys, that, we're talking about $2.7 million, and okay. we're talking about $300 here and $50 here. And it adds up. Uh, and we're not adding up that much. We're not building that much anymore. <laughs> so, that's one of the problems we're having about new revenue coming into the town is that we don't see any more thousand lots come, uh, being built. We're not going to see any, any more b uh, big building booms because. The big uh, swaths have already been taken up, so we've got to get a little more creative, other than looking at raising fees well, because this may that's be the new normal. That's a, it's a, it's a right. A new normal is that we're not going to be having uh, lots of uh, new revenue, 2.1, 2.5 million dollars each year, well, uh, and so um, we've well, got we knew to, this was coming. So right, you know, but but now we have to deal with it. We so. have to decide at at what price for our excellence. When it comes to everything, we're, we're, our town is doing wonderfully. Our schools are incredible. Our public safety is wonderful. Our, we were all just talking about DPW is wonderful, but at what price? What, what price this excellence and, and, and is it sustainable? Is it sustainable year after year if we if, if it means it's going to cost us more than two and a half percent every single year? So a couple of thoughts um, specific to Mr. Ted Stone's point. Um, I do think that we do need to townwide 
including within the schools and elsewhere, <coughs> I would strongly suggest that we do look at any fee, any user fee opportunity that's out there. In other words, if we go and raise this, the two million in the excess levy plus the two and a half, you know, we're going up four or five million dollars already, um, that's gonna hit our senior citizens who don't use a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So as we go into these big expanses with our tax burden, you know, I really think it, wherever we can, and I know we all are obligated to provide a good education, we're all obligated to pick up the trash, we're all obligated to do all these things with each other, but wherever there's an opportunity for fees-based uh, revenues, we should look at that, because then that moves the burden. Now maybe it's not, I'm not talking about 50 bucks at a time, I'm talking collectively the entire community, moving the burden to those that are using and getting a direct benefit. And because the seniors are still gonna have to pay a boatload as we figure out this out, no matter what the final number is. Um, so they're gonna do their fair share, and others are gonna do their fair share, but if they're not using a lot of these services, maybe there's a way to shift some of that burden there too. Um, so, I like your thinking, but I, if there's not, we can't determine what we're going to do tonight. Right. right. No, I'm just saying for the topic of the conversation, we no, get but, together. But that's great. I know the schools have moved away from bus fees or larger bus fees, and they've moved away from larger athletic fees, although they're increasing their athletic fees in this particular budget, right. and they're moving away from other things. But, you know, there's a, there's a big chunk of the population that uses those great assets called our public schools, but there's also a big chunk that does not. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to see us look at that. <clears throat> there's big chunks of our population that use certain services in town that we provide, and others do not. So how can we look at that, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we make a, a trash pickup, you know, a voluntary, or a, you choose to pick up or not. If you don't pick it up, then there's not a fee. If you do have it picked up, then there's a fee. I mean, I don't know. We have to figure these things out. Well, I mean, even with the schools, they were saying the bus contract's gone through the roof, and they've got an awful lot of kids that are basically occupying two spots because one day they're taking the bus home, and one day they're taking it to daycare. So that's doubling the amount of space they need on some of these buses. So, you know, maybe that's a case where they look at fees for you're allowed one seat for one route. And if you need a second spot, you do have to pay a fee. I think they're looking at they that. Do that's that. exactly the kind of stuff that that's we all need to do. They, 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 they they <clears throat> one of the problems is that the, that the bus contract uh, contracts aren't as competitive as we, as we all would wish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how they went up 183000 bucks when fuel is basically cut in half since the last... Well, uh, well, we haven't, we haven't, uh, we uh, took our extension on the last contract, so it hasn't been just three years. I believe it was, it's been five years since we negotiated our last contract. Okay, so five years ago, I think fuel was. And probably it's more than fuel, I guess. I guess. You have to think about cost of living for the drivers. You have to think about the, everything. In, you know, all the insurance and excise taxes and all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, but but again, it's not as competitive as we wish. We only got one bid back uh, from uh, what we sent out for. Uh, for bids so it's you know it, it, there's a lot of stuff that's happening the schools are really trying that they're, they're, they're trying to cut cut as much as they can just as we, we're going to try so yep. we're all going to get together we're going to try it okay. but i'd like to move on if i may to uh to capital hearings because we've got uh we got a, we got a, a that's uh that's a big one okay. so mr chair given the fact that we're having a big discussion yeah. about budgets i move that we skip the next agenda item and move to the item following that because I don't see how we do all kinds of capital stuff at the same time that we're talking about this stuff. We already did the, ne the next one, didn't we? we no, we, we well we we already while waiting for, while waiting for you we already went through town meeting articles, but we have some reports, town managers report. I guess I'm just trying to make a point. Yes, but I but you get a point. Yeah, I, it's true. We should really probably go through all that stuff at the at the next meeting also because that's that, that's adding up to. Uh, a, a good chunk of change. So, what is the uh, what's the feeling of the board? We want to discuss that in the, in the big group. Okay. What do you think? I, we've had our colleagues here tonight waiting to talk a little bit about some of these items, so maybe we'd be, I think it's fair to sort of let, let them introduce them. I don't want to beat up anybody tonight, though. You say you, you're kind of in attack mode right now. It's okay. It's all part of the experience. He's feeding me candy. I'm okay. I get beef jerky too. Not at all. Once. It's spicy. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Wright, yeah. you okay with continuing on? Mr. Kamalo, your opinion, please. Yes, I, I, I think since we have the four department heads here, they can simply introduce the capital projects. Okay. And we're, we're not going to beat them up. 
I cannot promise that at this juncture. Can we laugh when they ask for something? <laughs> <laughs> I think an abbreviated form of their presentation would okay. be much appreciated. Uh, all all right, so then, Mr. Kamala, would you? Uh, since, we don't need like, the sales pitch. Since this is the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't since sell the, the sizzle, the world, just the steak. Would you please uh, introduce the, uh, the players? Yes, uh, with your permission, I, I'll ask all the four to bring up chairs and. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Thank you for your consideration of hearing us. Oh, if Cook Cumlin was here right now, he would say, if I had one grenade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. <clears throat> I've just told you not to be fighting. That's not fighting. Yeah. John's one was like, good evening. I'll tell you one thing, we can cut money back on our color copies. I put the two for One sided. Yeah. <laughs> this is just like some of the DPW projects. Yeah. For your review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, John. <laughs> so I will there. walk you through these briefly because I know that you are taking extra time this evening. Uh, the first item that we have is a sidewalk plan. This is $1.75 million to construct the next phase of sidewalks in town. And <laughs> this reflects <laughs> the results of the planning board survey. And this is one of those items that we pulled off uh, last year's budget. And what I did was to give a la carte pricing so that if you don't wish to look at all of the items, you can look at those that are more of a priority. For example, uh, the sidewalk on Hayden Row that extends from EMC Park to Chestnut Street and would service the new Marathon Elementary School. If there are no questions, I'll just move through these. No, it's not going. Bless you. Uh, the next is a new multi-purpose municipal tractor. Uh, we are looking to purchase a third multi-purpose tractor for clearing snow primarily off of our sidewalks. This will increase public safety by clearing sidewalks of snow and ice quicker after storm events. Currently takes between 8 to 16 hours to clear our sidewalks. It's grueling on those operators that have been out fighting a storm for extended hours and it sometimes takes us two to three days after a storm to clear those. We currently clear 17 miles of sidewalk after every storm, whether it's snow or ice. And three of those miles were added over the previous two years, and we're looking at adding another five miles over the next three years. Areas like Legacy <coughs> Farms, where there's a dense population, there's a network of sidewalks leading to the center of town, so we will likely be asked to extend our services into those areas. So that's how it's determined which ones you do? Yeah, they do. I'm sure we do. <coughs> Somebody that's center of town, and is that how it's determined which, which sidewalks make it into your mileage? We, uh, we haven't added great lengths in the past, but uh, for example, we've added those that we added down Ash Street. Um, we clear those because of their proximity to the center of town and extends and connects to existing sidewalks that we clear. Anything on the west side of town gets done? We don't have a lot of sidewalks on the west side of town. We do clear the sidewalk, uh, the new sidewalk that we did on West Main Street. Um, there, there are some subdivisions granted, and what I meant by that was uh, collector streets. I was just causing trouble because I got a, just got a new snowblower, and I was doing I was doing my neighborhood because it was kind of fun. You live in a ten million dollar house and you bought a used snowblower. <laughs> 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 Through you, Mr. Chairman. The next two are a replacement of two dump trucks. Uh, these, uh, one is 13 years old and one is 12 years old. We're looking to replace them with uh, similar, similar dump trucks. And if you recall, three years ago, these were up for replacement. And what the DPW did was we extended the life by three years by simply replacing the dump bodies on them. It was an $11,000 cost, which bought us another three years of life out of, out of both of those trucks. So we're looking to replace two of our uh, F550 dump trucks. Then we get into uh, sewer and water enterprise fund items. Uh, the first one is to update our comprehensive wastewater management plan. It's $150,000 to update the town's 2004 comprehensive wastewater management plan. And what this will do is reassess areas and towns of critical need for sewer service. 
And this also satisfies a goal of the town's master plan, and this would be funded from the sewer enterprise fund. What it does is it looks at those areas that were identified back in 2004 <coughs> to extend sewers. Um, for example, Lumber Street and the new hotel district are not part of that comprehensive wastewater management plan in the service areas. So it would reassess the areas of critical need for sewer service. Next, we have a replacement of our 17-year-old backhoe that's used by the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. It is a 17-year-old backhoe, and it's used on a daily basis by the Water and Sewer Divisions for emergency repairs, utility replacements, et cetera. It has been postponed for some seven years, and the controls are now unsafe because they're loose and do not respond in a precise manner, which is essential when working alongside employees <coughs> or fragile infrastructure. Uh, the rollover protection system is rotting. The bottom of the doors have rotted away, et cetera. Excuse me. I, I know I'm not cutting into this stuff. Are we allowed to buy and use equipment? Sort of like what, what, the, what uh, sure. the Chief Slayton did. Yeah. What, you know, what you did with, um, uh, with the, with the uh, ladder truck. You know, I don't know if we if we could just have to go through the Okay, I'll, I'll just, because some of these yeah. things. We can buy your stuff. Mm -hmm. That's fine, sorry. It's quite all right. Uh, the next two are replacement of water mains. One is Cedar Street water main, and that's approximately 2,000 feet of water main on Cedar Street. And this would extend from the intersection of Main Street to basically just beyond C Street, so going down the hill. Uh, this is one of our most porous pieces of water main, and it's one a couple of years ago we had some six replacements or uh, repairs just in that 2,000 feet. And this would be funded by the Water Enterprise Fund. And then the, the other one is a replacement of portions of Hayden Row water main, and this is one that was mentioned previously at a Board of Selectmen's <coughs> meeting. Uh, we're looking to replace uh, 2,700 feet of water main with a 12-inch water main and 2,300 feet with a new 8-inch water main. The existing water main is filled with tuberculate to the point where we are experiencing water quality issues and firefighting capabilities of the system are becoming compromised. We have uh, two more to round out our capital request for this year. The first is $170,000 for uh, further evaluation up through permitting of the Pratt Farm well field. This would be the installation of three test production wells, installation of observation wells, conducting an extended duration pumping test, submitting a notice of intent to the Hopkinton Conservation Commission, and submitting a, uh, a DEP pumping test report. And this, through you, Mr. Chairman, this would bring us up to the point of approval from DEP should we continue to pursue water at the Pratt Farm well field. And the last one is one that we do every year, uh, and it's the uh, Chapter 90 Highway Funds. We typically receive some $650,000 from MassDOT. We supplement that through the DPW's operating fund with $350,000 to bring us to a million dollars worth of investment in our infrastructure. And one of the drivers that you'll see in the DPW budget is what we're proposing this year is to seek, instead of $350,000 in the operating budget, $550,000 in the operating budget. And what that will do is to increase our investment this year to $1.2 million. And the difference between an investment of a million and $1.2 million is the following. We currently have a pavement condition index of 75 every year through the management of those funds that we get and uh, competitive bidding, we've been able to increase that pavement condition index, which means the roads in town are getting better and better as far as their, their, their condition. If we invest a million dollars in this coming year, we will <coughs> likely remain at that 75. So our pavement condition index will neither go down, but it won't improve. And the backlog of our roads that need to be fully or, or worked on would increase to $11.5 million. If we invested an extra $200,000, our pavement condition index would increase to 80, which is a great improvement. Over the past couple of years, we've been able to go up by one half, one and a half, 
this would increase by a five and it would drop that backlog from 11.5 to 9.2. So we get a bigger bang for the buck, we get a better drivable uh, road surface across town and it decreases our backlog overall. Those are our capital requests this year. So the, the $2.7 million that comes out of some combination of water and sewer, are those, were those already calculated uh, or accounted for when we were going through the water rates and sewer rates? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, they were. The only one that wasn't uh, was the, the backhoe because we thought that we could put that off for yet another year, but we see that we can't. So all those others <coughs> were in our long-term five-year projection. But there are others in addition to that in that long-term plan too because they're years out. Yes. Yeah. So there's other stuff. That was millions in that, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, stuff. no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying that uh, when we set the water and sewer rates, they were already accounting for right. the fact that these expenses were going to come up. And those are coming out of those funds and not the operating budget right. in town. So it's not, you know, well, it does have to get voted on. It's not right. like it's adding anything unpredicted to. Uh, and it goes to more of the user base for those particular exactly. services. Exactly. I'm okay with yeah. as we go forward. As I looked at this as he made his presentations. There's some very simple no's on some things, and there's some very simple yeses on some things, just as initial gut reaction based on sure. what we can afford, what's being user-oriented, and what's general taxpayer-oriented. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff I think we need to hold on, some of the stuff we should proceed on, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're also open to that idea of a stainless steel water bottles that was mentioned earlier. Those Yeti cooler bottles are amazing. Put ice in those in the morning, <laughs> yeah. and at five o'clock there's still ice in there. Like the next day, the next day. What do they put? It's just crazy. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine. It will just eliminate lunch and coffee breaks. But you'll get a twelve dollar cup. Um, so, Mr. Westling, can, can we? We were just we were really just going to have them present. Right. Then. Mr. Westling, I look forward to beating you up at a later date. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Is that okay with you? Dick? That's fine. <coughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Where's our next PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, basically, the only thing uh, we're asking for at the police department is uh, just the, uh, the scheduled cruises. We've been on the uh, a schedule for two years, <coughs> two cruises uh, per year. Um, How many? Uh, two. This year we are going to ask for three. Um, I have I have this all taped up for three, but in light of all the uh, doom and gloom, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we we were able to get we, we were able to get a, a, a substantial uh, gift from this uh, Helen uh, O'Brien who passed right. away, yeah. and we've already uh, begun the process of purchasing a, uh, a vehicle that is specifically for uh, police equipment. So. I'll be uh, changing it to uh, asking for for two cruises, which will will we'll, we'll still be it'll, it'll get us to the point we need to uh, to be at because of the uh, the increased patrols and the extra miles on the car that have been accrued because we've been kicking the can down the road. But uh, that that gift certainly will help us out. Along so is Officer, Officer Phil going to get a new one? Or he's still going to drive the old no one. No way. He's styling. Do you have any use for an old backhoe? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, basically, uh, you're all aware of uh, you know uh, the cruiser situation and what we went through uh, uh, last year. But um, we'll be able to get by uh, with two uh, new to in the capital request with the supplement of the uh, the gift account. I have such a great suggestion, but I cannot say it on the microphone. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. okay, that's good. That's it never great. stops you. No, I'm, so, I'm glad you gave you some constraint there. That, that's, that's awesome. It's that's restraint, great. not constraint, but okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, no, I'm good. That's, so is that it for the police? Is that just the one that's capital it. article? That's it. So, so, so just he the just one wants car. one cruiser. Scheduled. Yeah. Sorry? So he just wants one just cruiser. Just the one cruiser. <laughs> 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 Why don't we just cut to the chase right now? <laughs> Chief, put in for one <laughs> and have a nice night. How much are mopeds? <laughs> All right, Chief Slammon. I think he's got to this job. He's doing it. I can't 
can't hear kids you. Kids don't. I can't hear you. Mr. Kamala was directing. I can't next. hear you. <laughs> <laughs> you go next, Chief. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> For fire, I have a uh, ambulance. It's a five-year-old ambulance, 36,291 miles on it. While the ambulance is in good condition, it lacks some important equipment, namely a power stretcher, a power load platform, and four-wheel drive. Um, these pieces of equipment, when we look at the employees, are valuable to help with back issues. That's probably one of the number one things you run into. So in the evaluation, it wasn't quite up for service. I looked at it to see if I could retrofit the existing ambulance for cheaper money and it, it led for the potential of more questions and problems than actually spending that type of money to retrofit it. The second piece I'm running is uh, the how other much, ambulance. How much is that ambulance, Chief? It's, a, a, it's 330000 and I would get about forty on a um, return on this ambulance, which is kind of a low estimate, but that's the estimate I got, and I, I actually ran a hard bid on it, so it's a solid number. So it's about $290,000 to do that. What it does for me, the reason I would hesitate to pull it is a couple of things. It, it's, it's a big employee benefit. We could survive for a year without it, just with the back. The other piece, though, is I'm currently running the newer ambulance more often because of the employee benefit, the four-wheel drive, and um, I'm worried that I'm going to kind of overrun that and it's going to lose its life expectancy. It's already got more miles than this ambulance. so. Yeah, uh, I just it makes sense in the longer term to try to cycle a new ambulance in, give the older ambulance the rest that it has, but still has the equipment, and the and the second ambulance is still very busy with what we have when there's uh, multiple calls or there's a piece of equipment out of service. So that's the short story on it. The second is a uh, car. It's the deputy's car. It's his primary response vehicle. It's in the replacement cycle. Um, short story, it's actually in um, good to fair condition. It has some rusting around the doors, but not bad. Um, it could get another year without much problem. The reason I present it to, the, to you this year is it, it is in the 10-year plan of the cycle of equipment that we have. I have uh, the new fire prevention officer that we brought on, and it would be a perfect vehicle to cover him for a couple of years in that role the deputy would still have a car. And then I told Mr. Kamalo, I'm in the process of evaluating whether there's another three year mix I could do between my um, plow truck, my brush truck, and this piece of equipment that I do some downsizing so it doesn't increase the fleet. And it's, it's a real probability. I just wasn't able to kind of fine tune that decision yet. So um, that one, it's a $46,000 vehicle. It could get put off a year. I could put the inspector into the plow truck for a year. So that's an option. It's not the best plan, um, but you could do it. The downside to it would be one more year with the deputy using it, whether that lasts to <coughs> a couple of years the other way with the inspector. Not a big deal, though. I could, if that was the ask, I could, I could work that, I think. Um, the final piece is kind of an uh, we put a placeholder in. It's a project that I picked up kind of as the fire chief and emergency management director is. Verizon has uh, requested us to um, replace the use of all our copper lines. It go it's, it's goes to all our communications equipment. It's a huge undertaking just trying to figure out what the cost of it would be. The feasibility of it has been a challenge and they gave us until like yesterday to get it done by. So. We're I'm evaluating that with IT, with the police chief, um, trying to see there's a lot of different options. There might be some, th you know, depending on what we do with uh, an additional fire station, town infrastructure, running of our own fiber, utilizing our over fiber. There's a lot of unknowns. But um, just basically $100,000 with antici anticipated costs, whether it comes from the general fund or whether we find another source is kind of unknown right this second. So um, it's just something you've got to have on the radar because I don't know when they're just going to start screaming that it has to be fixed, and it's our—it's a major part of our communication system. So they want to go from copper to fiber, fiber optic. They want you to go to fiber. There's, there's different expenses with the fiber. There's different connections you have to make. You have to talk about backup power and things like that that don't exist with fiber. So there's, there's a bunch of elements which I can't tell you I'm the expert on presenting it to you, but I can—I I, kind of have the quick snapshot. We basically use our 
George Voorhees, our local communications specialist, who, with all these other towns that are scrambling, trying to get him to give us the information to get this done has been a challenge. But um, in that same program, the police have a repeater that's actually in Holliston. We want to do an update by, we've done some studies, and we need to put another repeater up by uh, the gas plant. Kinder Morgan has a big tower there. We need to do some work there. That's, this is all in that kind of $100,000 model. Um, it's really rough, but um, it's going to come at us like at lightning speed, so I just stuck a placeholder in there just so we would know it's there. That's all I have for the fire department. Okay. Dave. Good evening. Um, there's a couple. I also have some vehicles that are having, you know, we have to hand down, hand me down, hand me down vehicles mm -hmm. for, for facilities, um, which we're, we're happy with. Uh, but they, they do only last for so many years. Um, again, I'm not sure, you know, our, our, you know, hopefully we can coordinate with PD as we did previously for their, their you know, trade-in vehicles. Sometimes the last time we used one of those. Um, again, they, they put a lot of miles on their vehicles um, really quickly, but they still, they can last facilities another couple of years. Um, they, and then there's a pickup truck, which I know, I think we could, I don't think it would go over capital cost of 25, so it might not be a capital discussion. Um, but it's just, <coughs> those are two things um, from a facilities operations standpoint. Um, the only capital article that I know, you know, would be going to town meeting is the undergrounding of utilities for the downtown project. Um, you know, right now that's estimated to be about a $3 million ask. Um, be not the best year for that, this to be coming to town meeting, but. Um, we have funding sources for that $3 million, don't we? Well, that, that, that's the estimated cost, including the. The, the, some of the, I call them earmarks, but some of the funding that's already been in place, kind of coordinated with town manager and finance department. <coughs> I don't follow. The, the actual cost for the undergrounding is about five and a half. Okay. Um, those other fundings that are already in place, the ask would be in probably $3 million. Okay. And then the, um, the other, you know, town buildings, there's a lot of studies going on, the center school advisory committee, uh, a lot of that's tied into kind of what we're going to be coordinating with, with uh, Chief Slamming on Woodville. <coughs> that's a building. We haven't really put a whole lot of work into it, um, but again, it, it kind of ties into all the other buildings, the Fruit Street buildings now. Um, you know, the new DPW is open, there's other uses for that. Those two buildings down there, um, kind of without a plan in place, we've been holding off on, on putting money into these, these facilities. Those are the two main ones. So for, for this fiscal year 19, we're not going to really asking for anything um, until, you know, the town has a, a longer term plan or goal for, for those um, buildings. And, and the other one is center school. Um, I don't have anything in fiscal year 19 for capital projects for center school, but, but uh, I'm certainly carrying, you know, expected operation costs for the building. But that's... Those are budget discussions, not capital discussions. So. Sure. Uh, just a thought as I think about sort of capital asset uh, or capital requests and budget conversation in general. Um, who are the elected boards that oversee significant chunks of money or expenses or revenue in town? It's the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, Parks and Rec. Who else? Does the planning board, they don't really have a big budget per se, nor do they have a big expense per se. Uh, board of Health. CPC, but that's a separate. No, that's not elected. They're not elected. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, elected. But they, but they yeah, Again, it depends on what you would consider a big budget. For, for, for us, $2 million perhaps is a big budget. Park and Rec is a minor budget. I mean, the government subsidy, the one that they're asking for now is 192000 Okay, so take park and rec off. So yeah. board of selectmen. School committee. School committee. School well. committee. School committee. School committee. But anybody, any other boards? No. Okay. Yeah. So as we get together for this meeting, if we can put this together, maybe we should have a standing motion on the table for everything we go through. 
with that group of 10 elected individuals at a, uh, the motion would be a straw poll motion. You know, we'll just, we'll have 10 people in a room that represent a lot of different people in town, or all of us in town, obviously, but, you know, and maybe do some straw polls as we go through these different things. These, uh, these articles, the other articles, you know, blind items in the budgets, and that way we can get a sense for what we can take out or what we can't take out of these budgets as we move through all this stuff. We didn't do that last time, I don't think. <coughs> And we've done that a couple well, of yeah, times. No, we've done it. No, the last time. Have we, we done like a, a straw we pulled out thing? A couple, no, no. We, I remember we pulled out the car. We pulled out the, the sidewalks. But I'm just thinking in terms of efficiency of that meeting. Like, <clears throat> let's just take the vote and see where everyone stands before we spend three hours talking about, you know, the dump truck, for example. Um, just to, as a way to kind of keep this. Because this will take forever, I'm concerned about. So, like my speech right now. <laughs> uh, for me, in, in, in terms of efficiency, I need to say this. I, that's why I'm so proud of working with these um, wonderful colleagues. As you had all of them, they're already making offers in terms of what they can take off the table. I think that is really remarkable. Even in my conversations with all of them, the many things that they took off from their list. Uh, I, again, in terms of efficiency, I just want to recognize the wonderful colleagues that I, that I work with. So noted. Wow, he was impressed. <clears throat> okay, anything else, Mr. Uh, uh, do you want to bring yeah, up, uh, do you want to talk about IT or? Uh, yeah, no, IT will let Josh speak to that. Uh, he's not able to, he, okay. in fact, we had not listed him for tonight. However, th there's one other thing that I had under the town manager's report. Okay. If we're done with the uh, capital. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you again for Thank your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for waiting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Brian appreciates it. <laughs> yeah. And at the town manager's request um, or report, I wanted to request the board to allow the homeowner at 13 Patriot Boulevard, this is a case that the board has looked at previously, <coughs> uh, to continue to rent the affordable unit for an additional year. Um, the board has looked at this previously, uh, approved the the request to allow the homeowner to rent the affordable unit uh, for the simple reason that one, the unit continues to be affordable, uh, and then two, uh, the unit is rented under conditions that the board has specified. In the past, these are the conditions that the, put f the board put forth. One, the rent shall not exceed carrying costs of the property as determined by CHAPA. Two, any rent above said costs shall be returned to Hopkinton uh, and put into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, three, any renter shall be income eligible and that the renter must be certified by CHAPA. And four, any request for the extension of the lease term must be made in writing at least 90 days prior to the end of the lease term. And finally, the homeowner shall furnish the town with the name and contact information of any renter. Again, this is in regard to uh, the possible rental of 13 Patriot Boulevard. Board has looked at this before, has granted the request, with the conditions that I outlined. Have they met those conditions? Yes, they have. Is this the third straight year that they're renting, or fourth? <sighs> yeah, third. I think it must be there. Yeah. And is there an end in sight to this, do you know? The uh, owner is overseas uh, with a medical issue, and <coughs> we believe that this would be the final year. This would be the final yes. year? Mm -hmm. Is that a good or a bad thing? <laughs> So do you need a motion? Yeah, I need a motion uh, authorizing the, the rental of uh, uh, 13 Patrick Boulevard under the conditions spelled out tonight. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? How much it carries? Good. it? Uh, we, we went through the rest of the uh, agenda. So at this point, uh, nobody has anything else. The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Be careful in the snow. Are we getting snow? It's not snowing yet, is it? Stop already. Already. Yeah, we'll start at one o'clock. There's a little bit in yeah. Central Mass where I was. But. Yeah.